Good afternoon. I'd like to thank you for rejoining today's Consumer Advisory Board meeting. This morning we discussed a new consumer tool which focuses on the auto financing experience. This afternoon we'll hear from Consumer Advisory Board members about the trends and issues that they are spotting on the ground. At every CAB meeting, we invite a few CAB members to share information about their specific expertise. To date, we have had CAB members present on a variety of issues, including consumer protection and service members, older Americans, arbitration, pre-acquired account marketing, among others. Following this morning's focus on auto lending, we will hear from Chris Kukla, who will provide us with a look at consumer experience in the auto lending and finance market. He'll highlight some areas where consumers are impacted, and then following Chris, we hear from Steve Magnani, who will provide an overview of financial service trends and practices in immigrant communities. C. Magnani has nearly 20 years of experience working in the community development and immigrant rights sectors, focused primarily on challenges of providing housing, economic opportunity, and support systems for new immigrants. She's the founder and former executive director of Chiad CDC, a member of the National Cap Ad CCD that works with New Yorkers of South Asian origin to advocate for and build economically stable, sustainable, and thriving communities. Chaya CDC reaches thousands of new immigrants each year through its organizing, educated, education, and service work. Chris Kukla is Senior Vice President of the Center for Responsible Lending in Durham, North Carolina. The center is a nonpartisan, nonprofit policy and research affiliate of Self Help, a community development lender that has provided more than $6 billion in financing to homeowners, small businesses, and nonprofit organizations nationwide. Chris leads CRL's work on auto lending issues as well as CRL's policy work in North Carolina. He also counsels policymakers and advocates in Washington, D.C., North Carolina, and other states on consumer lending legislation and regulation. He graduated from Alma College and has a law degree from the University of Notre Dame Law School. Prior to joining CRL, Chris served as congressional aide for five years, focused primarily on arbitration and on appropriations and financial issues. Chris, please begin. So it looks like my slides aren't up yet. Um, so this is going to be fun. Uh, <laughs> well, in that sure. case, um, you want me to go ahead anyway, or should we? Seema, you ready? Just go? This is ready. And All right. We, we, okay. we, we, we are flexible. Seema, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so my name is Seema Agnani. I am uh, the director of policy with uh, National Capacity. Um, it's the Coalition for Asian Pacific Americans uh, for Community Development. Uh, we're a coalition of about 100 uh, community-based organizations around the country working on economic vitality and community development. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about financial trends and practices in immigrant communities. So I apologize, I know that some of the CAB members, um, this may not be new information for you, um, but I uh, thought it was important to take a step back and sort of give an overview of, of immigrant communities nationwide. Um, and then I'm gonna sort of uh, move us to um, some of the factors that play into, um, you know, the, why new Americans are more vulnerable to predatory practices. Um, and then lastly, I'm gonna share a model that, that national capacity has been testing um, the peer lending circles um, tied to immigrant um, uh, financial education. Um, so, so first I just wanted to um, share sort of, you know, who are the new Americans and what the diversity is. So, um, you know, in 2014, the foreign born made up 13.3% of the total population. <coughs> Um, and in 1990, more than 80% um, of the foreign born were living in cities with populations over a million. So the point here is really that, um, you know, a large percentage of our uh, new immigrants are living in the major cities. And that's what I'm gonna focus on today. I know that there is a very um, substantial immigrant population in, in rural communities, but really the issues I'm gonna focus on today are in the cities. So here again, just to give people a sense of, of the diversity, um, in New York City, immigrants and their children make up more than 60% of the population. Um, so six out of 10 New Yorkers are 
um, immigrants or their children, and not one um, population makes up more than 12% of that immigrant group, not one ethnicity. And so New York is unique in that it, there isn't one, ne one necessarily one immigrant group that, that, um, that a city agency could target for sure. Um, so, so working in that kind of diverse population comes with its own challenges. Um, in Houston, um, the, the immigrant population um, it makes, uh, makes up almost 60, hold on, I don't want to get this wrong, I pulled this data out for us. Um, it increased by 60% um, from 2000 to 2010. Um, and 44% of that is made up of Mexican immigrants and another 13% from Central and South America. So um, in Houston, the population looks a little differently. And then I pulled up some data about Arkansas since we're here. Um, and the immigrant population here, um, what's, what's important to note here is that it's growing. Um, it grew by 82% uh, in the last decade between two, 2000 and 2010. Um, and immigrants made up 7% of the workforce in Arkansas and 10% and of children in the state. So, um, so this population is growing. There's also um, worth noting a substantial uh, population of Marshallese, uh, COFA migrants here. So for those of you that don't know, COFA stands for Compact of Free Association. So um, these are, this is an agreement between the U.S. And, and the Marshall Islands, and so their status is similar to that of Puerto Rico, um, similar type of representation. So they qualify for some benefits like the EITC, and others they don't. Um, So factors contributing to vulnerability to predatory practices. Um, you know, I wanted to just share sort of the overall statistics on the elite, uh, limited English proficient population in the US. Um, overall, um, it is about 8% of the total population. Um, what's notable here is that 19% of the LEP population was also uh, born in the US. And so it's not only immigrants. And those with limited English proficiency also have much higher rates of poverty. Um, and so this uh, four times more likely piece you see on the right um, refers to, uh, that comes from one of the studies that my organization conducted recently on Asian American and Pacific Islander seniors. Um, Leading into what I'm going to talk about next, uh, those uh, AAPI seniors are four times more likely to uh, conduct their banking in their own language. Um, I wanted to make a note about ethnic and community media. I couldn't find good research on it, um, but <clears throat> what I was able to find is this statistic from CUNY in New York City, um, which basically showed that um, um, 4.5 million is sort of the circulation of community and ethnic media equal to about 55% of the population of New York City, but only 18% of the city's advertising resources are going into community and ethnic media. Um, so just to say that, you know, when we're talking about predatory lending, we all know that advertising has a big role to play in it. Um, and I think that the, um, there's a lot of opportunity for us to think about better strategies and working with, with media when, when addressing financial education and combating predatory practices. Okay. So this chart is from a study that my organization did with the National Council of La Raza, the National Urban League. Um, it was called Banking in Color. It was released in 2013. Um, and really what we wanted to, to look at was what are the financial practices of, of communities of color, what do we have in common, and where, where are our differences. Um, so in terms of bank account ownership, um, really the, the ultimate story here is that about 80% of people are banked, 20% that are not are using alternative financial services. Um, and those that, are, that have the lowest rates of being banked are on the extreme end. So those who have been in the country 
for less than 10 years and those who have been in the country for more than 40. Um, so we're talking about seniors and newer immigrants. Um, it's generally those, uh, that trend is consistent among the different racial groups. Um, one story that I always like to share is of a senior citizen who came to one of our organizations um, and they asked her if she was banking. She was a Chinese immigrant um, and she said, yes, I'm banking. Uh, and then they asked her a little bit more about how she was banking and it turned out that she had a safety deposit box and she was going into the bank and putting her cash into the safety deposit box. And so these are the kind of stories that we hear. So when you say people are banked, are they really using banking services is a real question. Um, so now I'm gonna sort of switch to the Asian American and Pacific Islander population. Um, National Capacity uh, rolled out this research uh, in 2015. Um, it is essentially a survey we conducted in seven languages um, through our community partners in five cities. We surveyed about uh, 2,000 individuals um, in uh, Chinese, Nepali, um, Bengali, uh, Korean, one or two others. Um, and, and what we again wanted to do was what are the financial practices and, and what's really happening. And what we found here is that um, most of our communities don't really know where to turn for financial services um, and that really reliance on family and friends is the number one source of where people go when they're not sure um, what to do or when they're looking for financial advice. Um, this is regardless of income status. Um, and we also found that community-based organizations were, were really underutilized in this arena. Um, a little, you know, there was an FDI survey that came out around the same time as this report, and our results were a little bit different. Ours showed um, a much lower usage of alternative financial services in the Asian American and Pacific Islander community, about 18%. But those that were being used were payday loans, check cashing, um, and non-bank money orders. Um, and then 10% were uh, cashing checks by endorsing to a friend or family. Um, recent immigrants are particularly vulnerable in this, in this scenario in terms of uh, where to turn for financial advice. So you can see by generation here. The other point here that's important to make is, uh, I don't know if you can see the statistic, but it says cash is king. Um, we found that 74% of those that we surveyed were still predominantly working in cash. Um, so here, uh, we're looking at where do people turn to for emergency funds. Um, and again, of course, the, the predominant place is family and friends, uh, regardless of generation. Um, the, the striking statistic is that 23% of those we spoke to really didn't know where they would go for emergency funds. Um, and you can see here, in terms of generation, it's pretty consistent. Um, so this I thought would be um, interesting um, in light of our recent conversations about uh, mobile banking and online banking. 74% um, of those who even used, inter used the internet did not use online banking. Um, so 75% of those we surveyed were, were online, um, but um, three-fourths of them were not using online banking. Um, and then credit scores, that um, chart on the bottom really just shows that people don't really know what their credit scores are in, in this research. Um, so again, this is sort of leading me to sort of share why people are more vulnerable to predatory lending practices. Um, in addition to um, the, the areas I just pointed out, some of the other issues I wanted to highlight was the uh, ethnic and community media. You know, if you uh, go to Southeast Queens or to uh, Jamaica, um, or even many parts of Brooklyn and turn on the AM radio, 
You will hear the Caribbean stations there, and you know, I would say 60% of the broadcast are advertisements um, for various financial services, and um, this is all in English too. So um, I also wanted to share that it's not just language issues; it's specific targeting, and it's um, it's cultural isolation. You know, so we often say that it's not just uh, limited English proficiency, but it's also cultural isolation. Um, which, which really makes uh, many immigrants more vulnerable to these scams. Um, then, of course, the high cost of living. We, we all know the story of the subprime lending. Really, I think the part of that story that isn't really often told is that um, I think many new immigrants fell prey to that because they're living in the highest cost cities and um, rents are too high. And so, in the end, taking a loan that might not have looked as good was actually more affordable than trying to pay for rent in a community that they wanted to be in. Um, immigrant status, of course, is always a factor. People are afraid to go to a mainstream financial institution, um, whether it's their own status or a family member's. Um, and then the fact that people are living in crisis mode, you know, I think um, when an emergency occurs, they don't know where to go. Um, wherever they can find somebody who speaks their language that they can turn to for, uh, for some resources or support is where they'll end up. Um, the working multiple jobs, hours available, I think this is why we see some of the cash checking and payday lenders um, growing in our neighborhoods because they're the only places that are open after working hours. Um, and the people that work there speak the language. So I think that has a lot to do with um, people's vulnerability. And then of course, transportation and neighborhood availability. Um, last month I went to, sh uh, or a few months ago, I was in Chicago visiting one of our member organizations there, the Korean American Service Center. And when I arrived in the building, the executive director had to take a few minutes uh, because somebody had just walked in who had taken a bus four hours to get to him. Um, and if you're familiar with Chicago, you know that um, Koreatown is no longer existent, uh, in existence. Um, it has um, kind of dissipated because of new immigrants that have come in, but also because of the increased cost. And I think that's really part of what um, my organization is looking at is what is the importance of these cultural neighborhoods beyond um, the good food that we all get to enjoy. Um, those neighborhoods actually play a really critical role. You know, we visited 9th Street yesterday here in, um, in Little Rock and a lot of the, the things that I saw and heard were very familiar to me and a lot of the same challenges that our groups are facing in terms of preserving those neighborhoods because those small businesses really are a critical source of information um, for a lot of people. Um, and then of course seniors and women um, <clears throat> in a neighborhood like the one I used to work in in Jackson Heights, Queens, um, they are definitely more vulnerable because they're in a neighborhood where they know people, where they feel safe walking around um, and where people speak their languages and so um, you know, these, these, all these factors combined, I think, really add up to making people more vulnerable to just using what's in front of them rather than being able to shop around and um, um, really look for the best product for themselves. Um, so that's sort of, those are the issues that, that I think our communities are dealing with and, and I think a lot of the work the CFPB has been doing is, is helpful. It's now the issue of getting that information to our communities. Um, so now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit to um, sharing a model that, um, you know, National Capacity has been working on for the last year and a half. Um, and, uh, you know, we think it's a model that works well in immigrant communities. Um, and uh, we are trying to expand this work. So um, really what it is is immigrant, um, you know, sort of financial education, coaching, uh, combined with this peer lending circle model. Um, so many of you may have heard about this uh, model which the Mission Asset Fund out of the Bay Area really helped to um, bring to scale, um, uh, but really it's a practice that is very common in many immigrant communities. Um, 
throughout Central South Asia, um, uh, South America, and, and in um, a lot of African countries, and, and even in Europe. Um, so essentially, it's a kiddie model. Once a month, everybody puts, puts in a certain amount, and each month, one person in a set group of people gets to take the pot, right? So the benefit of it is that um, you get a large sum of money um, at a time, so you can actually plan around that. Um, but then also the benefit of, of the model in working with the Mission Asset Fund is that it gets reported to the credit bureaus. And so those folks without any credit history or um, who need to improve their credit can start to build that way. And they also start to build relationships within their circles um, so that when there's an emergency, if one member of the, of the circle really needs the money that month, the group can come to an agreement and they can decide to share the resources um, with that person that month. So sometimes um, the pool, the monthly pool ends up being as small as $500 and it can, I've seen pools, lending circles that are, are getting to as large as two, three thousand dollars $3,000, but um, depending on what the group decides is affordable to them to, to put forward every month. Um, but what we also have found is the peer lending circles alone don't do the trick. You also need to uh, integrate it with the financial education and alongside other services. So um, our, um, we piloted this project with um, uh, four organizations in four cities initially. Now we've expanded, I think, to eight cities. Um, and each of those organizations was asked to um, integrate this model with their existing services. So they integrated it with their C ESL classes, civic, en engagement, um, civic engagement classes, and or other entitlement benefit services. And, um, and that really was what made the difference rather than in an isolated way offering a service, but really, um, you know, suppose somebody is trying to build up the savings to apply for citizenship. In this model, they're able to get a big chunk of money that can pay for the citizenship application. Um, so tying it to that made a big difference. And then we heard about coaching earlier today that also made a big difference instead of counseling, but coaching um, is really a model that, that we think works. Um, so just some, some key findings. Um, you know, we found that um, there was a significant increase in people's confidence and knowledge. 50% um, of them after the program was over said they were budgeting on a regular basis. Um, there was a 27% increase in the number of clients who reported financial stability was their goal. Um, so in terms of changing behaviors, this model really works. Um, and then you can see that uh, the average credit score improvement was significant. It was 133 after um, going through this cycle. Um, and, you know, repayment rates and uh, default rates were very low. Repayment rates were as high as 98%. Um, so uh, the, you know, the lessons learned, I guess, are that financial capability is gained ac across the spectrum of financial <laughs> services, uh, service delivery, um, and product dissemination is best done in combination uh, with, with uh, the education. Um, and then in order to address the issue of language diversity and, and uh, immigrant diversity, um, we really feel that public-private partnerships are the way to go in terms of solving this in the long run, um, and of course in partnership with community-based organizations. I think, you know, because each city looks a little different, the local groups will know which languages are needed and how to really reach those communities. Um, and of course, trust is a key ingredient. Um, you know, I think the community-based organizations have earned the trust, and then the peer lending model the benefit of that is people are working with other members of their community and, and that trust also exists in terms of sharing their resources. Um, and then that last piece is really about, um, there's a lot of opportunity here. We're now starting to test this with youth and with seniors, uh, with women, um, and, and it really seems to be working well. So that's all, that's all I got. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Uh, thank
what I'd like to do now is to, if we could get Chris's presentation up, then ask him to um, make his comments, and then we'll, if we have time after that, we'll open up the floor for questions and discussion. I'm the one who gets to get up and stretch my legs, so y'all should do the same. I can, I can tell we're starting to fade a little bit. Well, let me, um, I'm gonna zip through some of these data slides um, because there's a, a lot to cover and certainly auto lending, as we learned this morning from the educational piece, is quite a complicated, um, complicated area. There's a couple of main kind of trends and themes that I wanted to focus on in this presentation. I think the first is to talk a little bit about some of the discussion that's been going on about subprime auto in particular and some issues around underwriting and the way that um, some of the, the changes in, in underwriting and terms that have been going on and um, address that. I'm gonna talk for just a second about add-on products, but we talked a lot about that this morning, so I think I can zip through that pretty quickly. And then I wanna touch a little bit on buy here, pay here, lots as well, and I know that in some of the data that was released earlier. I talked about that in, in here in Arkansas, there are quite a few uh, buy here, pay here dealers in the area. So I wanted to talk a little bit about who they are, kind of how they operate, and some of the, the things that we've seen as we've looked at that. Before I start, I always like to do a little bit of level setting just to make sure we're all sort of on the same page here. Um, so one of the things about auto lending is that folks tend to look at it and, and compare it to mortgage because mortgage is sort of familiar, they've heard a lot about it, they, they see it that way. There's a couple of big differences in auto lending compared to mortgage, however. So especially if you do lending through the dealer. If you do it through, through your bank, it's going to be you know, a typical loan product, product. But doing it through the dealer, this indirect lending model, it's through a retail installment sales contract. Um, so it actually technically isn't even, it's not a loan, it's, a, it's an installment contract. Um, the contract is between you, the consumer, and the dealer, and the dealer is then gonna sell that contract to a third party, it's a bank, credit union, finance company, whoever. Uh, Professor Fox has talked about how in her, an earlier career, she was the one that was, you know, hang in the paper, so she, she knows this well. Um, the dealer, in most cases, has been in contact with that third party, maybe one, maybe multiple, to figure out what terms they're willing to accept. Everything from interest rate, loan, how long can I go, how much, how much loan to value can I do, they do all of that. So those conversations, in, most ca in a lot of cases, have happened already. Uh, before you even start talking to the consumer about what the terms will look like. Um, so I think it's kind of important to, to acknowledge that's, that's how it works. Um, and there's a couple different places in here, that I, a couple places where I think it's, it's important to keep that in mind. A second thing is that we've heard this a lot about that there is a bubble growing in subprime. And I will be the first to tell you that I am not one of the people who says it's a bubble. Um, and I'm very careful to tell reporters or anybody, listen, this is not a bubble. Um, even though the reporter will still put me in the story where they call it a bubble, I keep telling them, I'm telling you it's not. For a lot of people, bubble is shorthand for there are some issues in the marketplace that are worth paying attention to and that if left unchecked could cause harm to either lenders, the, the economy, and specifically borrowers. Um, the second piece is that it, we often talk about, you know, and I've, I've said this, is that there are some conditions in the auto lending market that remind me of things going on in the mortgage market pre-crisis. I will be the first to tell you they are two very different markets. I understand, and it's always in there. No, it's not as big as the mortgage market, so if it crashes, it won't have the same economic impact. The piece I do say, however, is that I hope that the standard is not that we only intervene when it is something that will completely and utterly destroy the economy. Um, but that if it's going to cause harm that we could otherwise avoid, it seems like that's a place where we might want to pay some attention. So there's my, there's my level setting. The two places within the marketplace that I think look a lot like mortgage, one is, within, was, is alignment of incentives, and then the other is in risk layering. And I'm going to talk a little bit about both of those. So first, I think it's worth sort of mentioning how important the finance and insurance uh, uh, office is to your local dealership. We talked a lot earlier about the information sites like Edmunds.com, like uh, Consumer Reports, things like that, that have given people a lot of tools to use in negotiating the price of their car. That's resulted in some pretty significant compression of margins within the new car and used car sales uh, piece, where 
car dealers are not making as much money moving the iron as they used to. Uh, in fact, most of the money that dealers are making is coming from either service, parts, or F&I. And this is from the latest NADA data book that shows that 41.9% of gross profit came from F&I, which is up from 25%. Um, service contract penetration is at 43% in 2015 compared to 36% in 2009. Also point out that a, a large dealer group, and it's, um, it's publicly traded in, its mo in some of its most recent uh, earnings data, uh, said that they were making $1,500 of profit for vehicle retail, and that's gross profit, um, from F&I. So $1,500 of every car that's rolling off the lot that is money that's coming from F&I. So, um, and I think one of the things to keep in mind as well is that the F&I manager, so the person who is selling you these, the finance product and the, and the add-ons, is paid a commission based on the amount of profit that they're able to build into the deal. So it doesn't matter how big the loan is, what matters is how much profit is there in that deal. So there's a significant incentive to pack as much profit in as possible. I mean, that's, that's a kind of com common sales piece. Um, but the other piece that I would just argue is that when you hear that it's a very competitive market, so you hear this a lot, especially in the industry trade press, this is a very competitive market. Well, it's important to understand that the competition is between the lenders trying to get into the dealership to get the dealership to, 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 give, to present that loan to the consumer. And while some of that benefit may, may roll down to the consumer, and this is part of what we talked about in the early in the morning process is, if that consumer has the leverage to be able to come in and with other offers and be able to leverage that competition, then they, then they succeed. If they're going in straight trying to just negotiate it from nothing, the chances are that they're not going to do as well because there's this powerful incentive on the other side to sell that person the loan that provides the most, you know, the most incentives to the dealer. So I think it's just an important thing to keep in mind. So in terms of lending and sales trends, I mean, one of the things that you've heard, we've heard quite a bit in the, in the industry, first of all, is that the auto sector is booming, and that's true. Uh, there are loans coming with that, with auto sales. So this is a slide from the Wall Street Journal that shows that, you know, new auto loans have um, significantly increased over since the, uh, since the recession. Um, and you can see that the, the number of subprime loans is starting, you know, is bouncing back up from where it was in the recession. Now, important to note that during the crisis and in the aftermath, um, auto lending really constricted. And you, you know, clearly the stories, I know Chrysler Financial wasn't lending to anybody with a credit score below 700 at one point. There were lots of people who were being left out of the credit markets it stands to reason that these markets would grow back. Now that lending has started to relax, now that we're starting to see some recovery in the economy, it makes sense. So it's not the issue that subprime growing in and of itself is the problem. We would expect that they would, that would happen, and I don't think, you know, I think reaching those markets is important. I think the, the concerns that folks have are in the later slides about what, what's being offered to folks in the subprime space and what, what's changing in that space. So let's talk a little bit about that. This is lending volume by channel. And you see on the left-hand side, it has the, what auto finance companies are offering, and then on the right-hand side, banks and credit unions. It's a little tough, tougher to see than I thought it would be. But in the auto finance company space, you see that blue line at the top. Those are folks with credit scores below 620. So you can see that that is a significant channel for that finance company um, piece. And you can see, sort of see, in banks and credit unions, it's running right along that red line. Uh, which is the 620 to 659. So banks and credit unions, and this is pretty true historically, have not really reached down into the subprime space in the same way that finance companies have. Um, but it, this'll, I think this is important in a, in a minute. This is open, outstanding open loan balances. And you see uh, the amount of subprime lending compared to 2012 has grown pretty substantially. This is one place where there's a lot of discussion about what, what share is subprime and how big is this. As a percentage basis, it stayed relatively the same, but auto lending volumes overall have increased significantly. So even though subprime may be a constant percentage, in terms of actual dollars, it's significant and has grown, uh, grown in a big way. This also points to an issue of data. And one of the things about the auto lending in, uh, industry is that data is a little tough to come by. Um, if you don't have the, the, the financial wherewithal to buy it, or if folks are even willing to sell it to you, you, you have to rely on a lot of the publicly available data, which is coming from folks who are sort of have an incentive to be aligned with the auto finance industry. 
experience, certainly one of them, they sell a lot of their services to the auto finance company, so they have a, you know, the, it, there, there's a tie there. Um, the American Banker wrote an article about a year and a half ago where they discovered that a number of the companies that were publicly releasing data on subprime had actually changed their definitions of subprime without sort of really telling people that or bringing it to your attention early on to say, oh, by the way, we changed this. So as you would start to compare it to their previous data releases, you'd find that subprime actually looked like a smaller percentage of the amount of outstandings, but that's because they had reduced the, they had lowered their threshold for subprime. So more loans were being considered prime loans, which of course then would change the way that these are, um, these are being, um, being expressed. So it's, it's, it gets more complicated to do apples to apples comparisons than we were able to do before. One thing that we're seeing is lengthening loan terms. And I think we've, I've heard a lot of folks internally, we've been talking about this. You can see from this here, the uh, green, sort of greenish bar is prime and the blue is subprime. And the average loan term now for a subprime loan is just over 67 months. Uh, and that has been growing, as you can see, significantly. Even in the prime space, you're looking at you know, an average of about 65 months. Um, it's been growing about a month a year, roughly, um, where it was not at that growth rate you know, prior to 2006. There's a couple of reasons for that, I think. The first is, is that the price of cars has outpaced wages. So the amount of money people are making is not keeping up with the increasing cost of cars. Um, cars are also continually being important to being able to get to jobs. Uh, a group out of Maryland did a study um, looking at how many jobs were available to people within public reach of public transit, and they found that only 41% of jobs in the Baltimore area was accept accessible by public transit. So if you want to get a job, you got to have a car, and to get a car, you have to be able to, to pay for it. Cars are getting more expensive. Even with these lengthening loan terms, the monthly payments, the average monthly payment is still at a, at a record high. Uh, as is the amount financed. So, so you have this affordability issue kind of colliding with this issue of, of paychecks staying relatively stagnant or in some cases decreasing. Um, with that and, and with another slide that we'll talk about in a second, you know, as you increase the loan term, you're underwater for longer than you would have been otherwise. So uh, one statistic is, you know, that I've seen is that um, for a 72 month loan, it's not until month 54 that you are uh, above water. And so uh, if you need to trade that car in for some reason, and especially if you see a 72 month loan on a used car, you know, there's a, there is a chance that that loan is going to outlive the actual vehicle itself. There's also just changing circumstances. You know, you buy a, a, a two door and then four years later you have, you know, you have kids and you get tired of trying to shove them in a two door car. You know, you, uh, you need a new one. So you can see here that there's, the, um, there's sort of a correlation between the lengthening loan terms and the amount of loans that have negative equity. Now negative equity is basically when you trade in your car and you owe more on the car than it's worth and you roll that unpaid loan balance into the new loan. And so uh, the data show that now around 29% of deals that are being done have negative equity in them. So almost, you know, almost a third uh, are basically paying for two and driving one. Also, one of the things that we're seeing, and this is again where the data, um, there's some frustration from at least our end on the data. Experian had been reporting this up until 2013 and then they stopped reporting it. Um, and we're not sure why. Um, but LT, loan to value ratios were all, have also been increasing. And you can see from this slide then on the far left, that uh, this is the sort of the change in loan to value ratio by credit tier. And you can see that loan to value ratios were increasing for subprime consumers, and then actually decreasing for superprime and staying relatively level for prime. Um, the next slide shows you, gives you a different view of it. How, what are we talking about when we're talking about the loan to value ratio? And you see for borrowers in the 620 credit score, and I apologize, there's no legend here, the dark blue is new cars and the light blue is used. Um, you can see that the loan to value ratio for a below 620 borrower is around 150% LTV. So they are borrowing 50% more than the car is worth. Now on a used car, you don't get that same instant depreciation hit driving off the lot that you get with new. 
you know, a new car, you know, you know the old adage, you drive the car off the lot, you drop 25%. Um, but it's not an appreciating asset either. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, 68 Mustang fastbacks, you know, this is, um, so, you know, in this subprime space where you see the loan to value ratios increasing, that's another reason for increasing loan terms because you're borrowing heavily against this asset. But when you stretch that loan term out, remember I talked about on a 72 month loan on average, it takes you till month 54 to get above water. Well, if you're at 145, 150% loan to value, it's gonna be even longer. You may never be above water until you actually pay it off. And so we're starting to see a little bit of a change in, in the, the delinquency and default numbers. Now, a couple of things I wanna point out here is one is that a lot of the delinquency numbers are for the market overall. And I think what we'll see in these slides here is that the numbers in prime, which are actually quite good, are masking a little bit of what's going on in the subprime market. So um, Fitch uh, issued a report recently that showed that uh, delinquencies in subprime auto ABS hit 5%, over 5% from February 2016, highest level since October of 1996. Um, now folks who were around for a while will remember that in the late 90s, there was also a significant event in auto lending um, where there were some serious issues in the auto lending practice. So seeing a number that harkens back to the late 90s is not exactly comfort. Um, and Moody's pointed out that underwriting continues to weaken overall with larger balances and longer loan terms. Now, if you read that report further, they say, well, everything is okay because investors have figured out how to make sure to protect themselves, um, which is great, but there's no mention anywhere about what happens to the borrowers who end up, you know, having their cars repossessed and um, what does that do to people reentering the market? And I think there's some legitimate concern there. Um, about a year ago, Wall Street Journal had Moody's Analytics take a look at some data that they had, uh, they had gotten from Equifax, and it found that early payment defaults increased to about 2.62%, which was um, the highest it had been since, uh, since before the crisis. Um, a couple of points uh, to, to make there. Um, they found additionally that eight, Eight and a half percent of subprime borrowers who took out loans in the first quarter of 2014 had missed at least one payment by November of that year, which was highest, also highest since 2009. Um, so you're seeing uh, some signs that the folks who are getting into these loans are having some pretty serious trouble paying them. Remember before I showed the slide about how, what kind of market the auto finance companies were in versus banks and credit unions, and you can see the differences in the delinquency numbers. Um, now they are certainly down from you know, the middle of the crisis, um, but they're starting to tick up. And I think one interesting point is that um, in most of the major other credit markets, delinquencies are dropping. Uh, you know, the, the, the market is recovering, people are at least getting more financially stable. Um, auto lending and student lending are the two that have the distinct honor of being my financial markets where you're seeing an uptick in delinquencies even, with, even in the midst of a recovery, which I think, and especially with this slide, showing that the folks who are the most active in the subprime space are seeing their loans increase, while banks and credit unions are seeing theirs decrease. When I talked about how Prime seems to be masking what's going on in subprime. This is part of what I'm talking about there. Talk a little bit about add-ons before I get to buy here, pay here. A couple things that we found in some, we did a survey of close to 1,000 folks across the country asking them about their auto lending experience. And one thing that we found was that African Americans and Latinos were far more likely to uh, report having bought a, an add-on product than white borrowers were. Um, I did not include this slide, but um, a corollary data finding was that uh, African Americans and Latinos also reported at twice the rate of white borrowers that they were given misleading information about their loan. Two, two main things that came out of that. One is that they were more likely to be told that an add-on product was required as a condition of financing, which is generally not true. And the other was that they were more likely to be led to believe that the interest rate that they received was the best that they could get. Um, now, it wasn't you know, necessarily told them that this is the best rate possible, but certainly they were led to believe that they couldn't do any better, which then cuts, you know, that stops you from negotiating. If you feel like you're getting the best rate, you're not going to keep arguing about it. And you can see that for three or more to add-on products, it was sort of the same. Um, in looking at that same survey, we also asked the question of whether they had missed payments. 
Um, and what we found was that as people reported buying more add-on products, they also showed a higher likelihood of reporting that they had missed payments as well. It stands to reason you pack more into the loan. We've seen the data already about increasing loan-to-value ratios, increasing, you know, and especially if you're at a high interest rate, that risk layering piece, that thing, you know, was something we saw in the mortgage market as well, was it's, these things don't happen in isolation. And so as you keep adding on things that increase the risk of the loan going bad, it's going to make the loan, you know, it's, there's a better chance the loan will go bad. So let's talk about buy here, pay here for just a second. So the buy here, pay here dealers are a little different uh, than the traditional finance market. Uh, these are the folks that are uh, on the, they're on the corner, they say, you know, they actually say buy here, pay here. A um, couple key differences. One is that to make your payment, you have to go to the dealership in most cases. It's weekly, not monthly. So you're making weekly payments on the car. Um, most buy here, pay here dealers do not sell their contracts. They keep them in house or they assign them to an affiliated third party that, or an affiliate that they've set up for tax purposes. So they, they hang on to the paper. So they're not selling it into the market. Um, so here's a, a couple key data points I think worth mentioning about this. Um, this is from the industry data that they release on a yearly basis. This is a hot off the presses as of a couple of weeks ago. In 2015, the average uh, purchase price from wholesale, which is from an auction or from somebody else, was $5,200. The average, they spent about $1,200 in rehabs and repairs, and most of that is cosmetic um, for a $6,400 investment. It's then sold for $10,900. Usually well above the the Kelly Blue Book or the the the, the actual value of the car, uh, with an average down payment of over eleven hundred dollars. So uh, it, the the difference is all it's roughly twice the the wholesale price. Payments are due weekly, as I said. On average, uh, it's a thirty six month you know term at ninety one dollars a week with an average APR of twenty seven percent. Um, the dealer breaks even on their investment uh, less than halfway into the loan. So once the, once the borrower has paid about 45% of the loan, they've gotten back whatever they paid for the car in the first place. Average borrower defaults after seven months. Um, this shows you the, you know, the market share of buy here, pay here is roughly, uh, you know, it runs depending on um, the credit cycle. So you can see up in, you know, in 2011, 2012, post-crisis, when credit was tight, 14, 15% of the market, you know, the used car market then starts to slide down to about 12 as part of the overall loan market, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 8 to 10%. Not a huge part, but certainly not insignificant. And a number of folks use buy here, pay here uh, to finance their cars. I think there's a, um, there are high delinquency rates high default rates, about a quarter of all buy here, pay here borrowers will default by the end of, by the, within the year. Um, you can see that the light blue lines are loans that, are, that do not pay to maturity. It runs about half of all of their loans. 25% um, are in collection and about 30% get written off. Uh, at industry conferences, you'll often hear the buy here, pay here dealers say, we are not in the car sales business, we are in the collections business. And you have to shift your mindset to that. Um, Couple things I'll just point out. There was a LA Times uh, series of stories in 2012 that talked about uh, the buy here, pay here uh, model. And we could talk about some of the legislative things that happened in California. Couple things about buy here, pay here dealers. They often don't price, put the price on the car. They pull your credit report, they figure out what monthly <coughs> payment you can afford, and then they tell you these are the cars you can pick from. Um, in, in California now, they actually have to put the price of the car on the, on the window, it's one of the only states that requires that. There was a settlement between the North Carolina AG, uh, the Department of Justice, and a dealership in uh, Charlotte. Uh, it was based on an ECOA claim where they were actually making broad statements about um, making sure to take advantage of African Americans. And, um, but it was, uh, that was part of the terms of the settlement was that they have to post the price on the car. Uh, the other term of settlement was that they can't sell the car for more than 10% above Kelly Blue Book value. The fact that they have to be told not to sell a car for 10% above Kelly Blue Book Valley tells you how much above Kelly Blue Book they were selling that. Um, and a recent uh, St. Louis Post-Dispatch article was talking, uh, looked at, uh, there were three small finance companies in the Missouri, in Missouri who were filing um, lawsuits in the courts. Um, three dealers, three buy here, pay here dealers um, 
filed 15,300 lawsuits in a three-year period in the local courts. Um, most of them resulted in default judgments. The average interest rates were between 24 and 29 percent. Um, the most interesting thing is 300 of those cases, they found that there, were, uh, there was a lawsuit by the buy here, pay here dealer and a lawsuit by a finance company around the same time to, uh, related to the same borrower. They talked to one of them. Um, she borrowed the down payment from a finance company at 62% interest. Um, you can imagine that loan did not work out well. Um, so that is that. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Seema. Um, we do have time for questions. Um, and I'll open the floor to the cab. Bro. Um, thank you. The, both of these were really uh, great uh, presentations, but I, I, I wanted to um, use this as, as for a moment for something we discussed uh, in, in a previous session, though. What's, what's interesting, um, uh, if we go into a little bit more detail on the breakdowns of, of, uh, of immigrants compared to other race uh, uh, categories, you find some, I think, really interesting things. First of all, uh, uh, I'm looking also at F and the FDIC study, which came out a little earlier before you. You know, Spanish speaking only, for example, are 82% unbanked, right? So, I mean, there, there are definitely pockets of this stuff that's very, very strong, and obviously also by particular types of other categories like uh, 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 undocumented status. But what's really interesting is that, um, again, if we look at the white population, there are about, there are more white unbanked than there are Latino unbanked <laughs> as the total number of population, and of immigrants, of course, right? And, and, uh, and, and oh, but actually, the total number of actual unbanked African Americans are the biggest number in, in absolute terms. But what's, what's, what I find was really interesting in terms of where we're trying to sort of focus our, our energy, um, uh, one ca um, uh, statistic is that uh, uh, about 70% of whites who are unbanked used to be banked. About 40%, 44% of African Americans who are unbanked, uh, um, no, actually it's more than that, 54% uh, of African Americans who are unbanked used to be banked. So this means that, there's, that the, the banking system is failing people. In a sense, there, there are some people who are being, basically being left out, right? And there is an issue of how access is, is, is developed. But there's another issue here that's happening, which is how people are going through the system and basically being kicked out of the system, right? And, I, and, and I, you know, one of the things that's really disturbing to me from this type of, of statistics is that you know, it's, it's, it's African Americans and, even, and whites more that are most being hurt by these situations. We rarely look at these, the, the way in which these, these, these uh, statistics are, are presented. And, um, I, you know, and I, I would just say that, that uh, um, uh, um, because there, 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 there is a, I think, it's particularly if you look at Arkansas, right, and where we are in Arkansas here, you, we are in, in, in a belt of very strong white poverty, right, that goes through uh, uh, the Ohio River Valley all the way really through Texas into uh, that, that it, it would be interesting to go further into detail in terms of what are the mechanisms that are, 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 are keeping people out. And this just back to Chris's uh, presentation, also in terms of the race um, uh, um, differentiation, right? And what, what's interesting is that the, the, the number of people who are uh, being affected by these, these types of practices uh, in absolute terms is also, uh, even though obviously it's disproportionate as a share of the population, uh, um, uh, Latinos and African, Amer and African Americans are as a proportion of their population being negatively affected. Again, the absolute numbers among whites are a lot higher. So it just, I, I think it's, it's uh, if, if there's, there's if, and, and this is a critique I'm making in general in terms of the way we, we generate statistics and, and talk about issues and how we frame them uh, as well. And finally, just the, the, how to get very specific about how we then help particular populations and their, and their, and their problems. Um, you didn't mention, obviously, the issue of remittances, right? 
because in many ways what's going on here is in the immigrant population. Uh, you know, these are uh, uh, community, these are populations where households are spending about 10 to 15 percent of their income supporting other populations across, uh, uh, outside of the borders of the United States, which by the way are by definition going to the communities where immigrants come from, right? So one thing we, I would just put it on the table for us to think about that, that the, uh, a financial empowerment uh, um, of immigrants, right, not only is of significant impacts, and, and because the numbers are really huge, the, the impact of getting financial empowerment by immigrants has a very dramatic impact in terms of their income and their ability to contribute to the United States uh, economy, but it's also a way of solving the problem of where people come from in terms of immigration. And uh, I just put that on the table for us to, to broaden the discussion a bit more. Yeah. Thank you. Just just one related point. The um, this data are a bit dated, but uh, a few years ago, Bloomberg did a report that said that 18 of the 1,800 bank branches that have closed since the recession at that time, 93% were in low-income communities, and I think that cuts across um, race. And so I think it supports the point that you were making. One, uh, one quick comment on the closing of accounts. Um, we actually did a, a study in, in Queens um, in partnership with a few other organizations and there was a high percentage of people who had been banked who closed accounts. Um, and what we found it was primarily because of the fees. Um, they essentially were overwhelmed by the number of fees, the overdraft, and ended up just closing the accounts in the end. Not check systems, not, not because they were kicked out because of excess um, overdrafts? I mean, yeah, that was part of check it. Systems. Yep, absolutely. Julie. Chris, can you define a subprime loan for me in the auto lending world? And I, I'm not sure I caught this in your presentation, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but do you know what percentage of consumers who got a subprime loan could have qualified for prime? Two great questions. <laughs> um, there are lots of definitions of where, where subprime hits, and so one of the challenges with the data, as I mentioned earlier, is that the data providers all have their own version of what is subprime. Um, in the auto lending space, you will often even see this middle category of non-prime. Um, so it'll be deep subprime, subprime, non-prime, prime, super prime. Um, and each lender has their own definition. I mean, I think, you know, generally speaking, you know, someone with a credit score below 680 generally, you know, kind of fits into that. But below 720 for some lenders can be considered subprime as well. So it just, it, it depends. Um, say that again. I'm sorry. Say that, again. that seven below 720, 680, 720 can sometimes be considered non-prime. So what do you do with that? I don't know. But... Um, they're not calling it prime, so, um, but I think when you get below 680 is when you can, you know, the, the general cutoffs are below 620 is in that deep subprime category, below 680 is roughly subprime, and then depending on who you're, whose data you're looking at, above 680, there's either two or three tiers compared to what that. In terms of the who could have qualified for prime and subprime, I, I, the, I, the data is just not out there. You'll recall from the mortgage discussions that was, you know, Freddie Mac's number from, you know, statistics that they were looking at, you would really have to have access to the credit scores and the, and then that's just that loan level data is just not, you know, it's available to some, but it's not available to us. Josh. Just a very quick question. It strikes me that, that the buy here, pay here is very analogous to rent to own in many ways. And, uh, we had uh, in New York done uh, um, work around rent to own and we mapped uh, the stores, the location of stores in New York and they're very heavily concentrated in communities of color. Uh, I imagine that varies some, but I, I wonder if in urban areas that's not the case also with buy here, pay here. And I'm just wondering if, if, if you guys have done that type of mapping and if you have a sense of whether uh, that's a piece of the business model uh, as well. Um, so we have not done that mapping, so I don't, I don't, you know, have that definitive data of where the stores are located. Um, 
you know, certainly I think you can get a feel for it by just, you know, driving around your community and you can kind of, you know where they are. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, you know, generally speaking, they're in lower income communities um, and, and heavily, you know, uh, communities that are heavily concentrated in, you know, minority communities. So, I mean, it just, I don't have the exact maps, but just from, you know, from what I've seen, it's, uh, you know, it's there. Yeah, it just, it strikes me that that might, it seems like a very troubling business model, obviously, and it strikes me that that might be yet another layer that's troubling. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot more, there's a lot more research to be done in that area. We've spent some time on it, and because it's becoming a, you know, it's one of the, it's certainly an issue that kind of keeps cropping up. We're paying a little bit more attention to it. Okay, a couple more questions, and we'll wrap up. Anne, and then Pedro. Chris, based on the data you presented, it seems like collections is a big part of the subprime auto market. And one of the more egregious or concerning practices that we've been hearing more about is devices that are installed in vehicles that shut them off if someone misses a payment or other kinds of very, very intrusive tools. Um, how common is that across the different markets? And do you see that as a current concern or a growing concern in the collection space related to those those loans? Yeah, I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, one point that I meant to add in the presentation, but I could tell I was going far too long, um, is in one of the reports, that, uh, recent reports that came out, I think, I think it was Fitch's report, I'll go back and look. Um, one of the trends that they noted was that um, the repossession velocity seems to be increasing, particularly in the subprime space. Uh, and what they were finding was that some of these lenders weren't even waiting for them to go 60 days past due before they were repossessing the car. Um, now that plays with the delinquency and default numbers because obviously that loan never gets to the 60 day delinquency mark and so it doesn't get reported. So if that's the case, and I've only, you know, this is the first time I've seen it, but certainly that's a troubling piece is if lenders are repossessing, you know, pretty quickly after, you know, one missed payment. Um, in terms of the GPS, you know, there's a couple different devices that folks, that folks use. One is a starter interrupt. So, you know, in talking to the folks who provide the technology, if done correctly, it prevents you from, from starting the car. Um, now, you know, you could be in a vulnerable situation when you go to start the car, um, but, you know, it, it's theoretically not supposed to cut it off while you're driving. So let's just make, make that clear. Um, but certainly, you know, if your car gets shut off, you're pretty well stuck. You know, you certainly hear stories about people, you know, shopping with their kids, you know, trying to get home and, you know, the car won't start. Um, the other is the use of GPS technology as a way to track down the car um, to find it for, the, for so that the repossession agent can find it quickly. Um, certainly in buy here, pay here, it is almost standard. Uh, for many subprime loans, we know that those are being used. Um, you know, most prime consumers don't want them and they don't try to force them on folks. So, you know, generally we see this in the subprime space. Um, you know, I'll note one thing, and the interesting about it is that, you know, it is a tool that if it was used, I mean, there's some real privacy issues with the GPS locator and the, the kinds of information that you can get from GPS location and the way that you could use that to leverage collections. Um, you know, if you happen to see that someone was going places that they probably wouldn't want people to know about, you might, you know, threaten to let folks know about that. There's YouTube videos from some of the providers where they show, like, we can tell you how long the car's been parked in that location, where it, the last three places it's been, all that stuff. Um, but, it, you know, it could be used as a way to drive down the cost of, of making the loan. Um, there's actually a credit union in Roanoke, Virginia, that actually, if you put a uh, starter interrupt device on it cuts your interest rate from about 16% to around nine. Um, so if that's the way it's being used, then actually it could be a really helpful thing because if it's driving down the cost, but what we're finding is that's not, you know, it's not discounting the cost. I mean, you're seeing a GPS locator or a starter interrupt on a loan with a 29% interest rate. I assure you, they're not getting a discount for that. Um, so what it's really done is cutting the cost of collections, which is great for the lender, but it's not, it's not getting passed along to the consumer, but it's an incredibly intrusive product. Pedro. Hey, Chris. Okay. Um, had a couple of points that I wanted um, you to address for me. A couple of things that we've seen in the market is around tax time, of course, there's an explosion of new buy here, pay here lots. 
um, and you have consumers who will purchase a vehicle from those lots, and within a few months, the lot no longer exists. And since it's so difficult sometimes to figure out um, who's really regulating these lots, um, what is your advice to consumers when they find themselves in a situation where they have a lemon, essentially, and nowhere to turn um, in order to get any recourse? Um, the second thing that we see quite frequently are uh, situations where consumers have applied for a loan and have been told to take the car and they drive it for a few days and they're told that the loan was not approved to bring the car back, but their trade-in has been sold um, and they will not return their damn payment. Um, and so we have a lot of frustrated consumers who now find themselves um, in a situation where they don't have um, their previous vehicle and they've lost money um, on the car. Do you see a lot of that in your research? And if so, where is it most prevalent? Two big questions that I'll try to answer very quickly because I know I'll get the hook. Um, in terms of the buy here, pay here dealers, I mean, certainly tax refund time is a great time for them because then you have cash in pocket that you can put down for the down payment. Um, so certainly if there's an issue with, with buy here, pay here, you know, an attorney general's office could help. You know, my understanding of the, the carve out is that it, because it requires, it, the carve out, the, one of the requirements of the carve out is that you sell your contracts to a third party that since most buy here, pay here dealers don't, uh, that, the, that the Bureau has um, some authority over buy here, pay here dealers. And so uh, certainly folks here could probably be helpful as well. So I think it's really reaching out to as many and all people that you can find as possible. Um, in terms of this, you know, the issue of the, the, the yo-yo scam, I mean, that's something that certainly has come across my desk quite a bit. And what this is related to is that the vast majority of auto deals that go out the door now are conditional deliveries. So there is a usually a, a clause in your contract. In some cases, there's not. They just the, someone asserts it anyway. Uh, that basically says that if the dealer can, if the dealer cannot find. Uh, a, a deal to, to sell your loan at terms of the dealer's liking, then the dealer is allowed to rescind the deal. And you are supposed to get your down payment and your trade-in back. You're supposed to be allowed to walk away from that deal. Certainly, we hear plenty of stories of people going in and finding out that their trade-in's unavailable or their down payment's unavailable. Um, but what it means is that virtually every car that goes out the door, the, there's the potential for this happening. Now, there may be some cases, and there are some cases where um, the dealer has basically sent you out without the, the deal being final and something has come up within the loan that, that requires you know, something different. They can't secure the terms that they had agreed to you with. But I think the challenge there, and I think that this is a bigger issue for another day, but it's, an, it's, it's a significant risk shift. So I mean, what it's telling people is, we're gonna send you out with the collateral and the financing's not final, which is one of the few you know, few markets where that anybody does that. I mean, imagine if Best Buy lets you go home with the TV and then decided three days later, you know, we, sh we sold it to you for five, but we really wanted seven, so give us 200 bucks or we're coming to get it. You know, usually when you walk out with the merchandise, you think it's final, but in this case, it's not. Um, you know, who's got the better, who's in the better position to assess whether or not that deal's gonna go through? Is it the, the dealer who's doing more of these deals in a day than most people will do in a lifetime, or the person who's walking out the door. And that's one place where I think there's there's a need for some attention. And on an ominous note, unfortunately, we're going to have to um, wind this down. Chris and Seema, thank you very much. A very insightful presentations. For our last session of the day, the CAB will have an opportunity to hear about the details and contours of the recent notice on proposed rulemaking in the small dollar and installment lending space. Over the past, past few years, the Consumer Advisory Board has examined research and trends in the small dollar space and has numerous discussions on small dollar lending. In general, most CAB members saw the need to provide access to this type of credit. However, many shared concerns that this credit not be predatory and further not put vulnerable consumers in more challenging circumstances and endless debt traps with egregious interest rates and terms. Last week, the Bureau unveiled its proposed rule to regulate small dollar and other long-term installment products. We have the privilege of being on the, one of the first groups to receive a briefing on this momentous rule making. I'd like to invite Kelly Cochran, the Bureau's Assistant Director of Regulations, to provide us with an overview of the proposal, after which you'll have an opportunity to ask questions and comments. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. It's, uh, 
pleasure to be back here a year after our last presentation. Um, at that time, we were starting the process of consulting with small businesses that would likely be affected by the rule and had put out um, an outline of the proposals that we were considering at that time. We saw it come in from th through the small business process as well as from a broad range of other stakeholders. Uh, we got your feedback and, and talked to a number of our other advisory boards. So we've been working for the last year to fine tune the proposals, to draft the document, uh, to do additional research and consumer testing on disclosures. So it's been a very busy year. Uh, it's glad to, be, I'm glad to be back. So on June 2nd, we actually released three major documents. I'm going to talk through all three today briefly to give an overview, and then we'll have time for questions and comments. The first is the notice of proposed rulemaking itself. The comments for that will be due on September 14th this fall. Uh, so it's, we'll have an opportunity and we're really seeking comment from a broad range, everyone who gave us feedback last time as well as additional people. The second piece is a request for information about issues that are not covered within the scope of the notice of proposed rulemaking. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but in particular, we're focusing both on products that would not be covered by the proposal, as well as some industry practices that may be occurring in the, even in covered markets, but are not covered by the proposal. The comments on that will be due on October 14th. And the last part that we released was a supplemental findings report that had six chapters detailing our research on additional topics uh, on top of four previous research reports that we had released. The Bureau has evaluated about 18 million loan files in the course of the last four years building towards this rulemaking. And so we've been uh, summarizing our research as we go, and we'll talk a little bit about the most recent releases from this spring and also on June 2nd. So as we discussed last time a year ago, our major concerns here with these markets is that we are seeing practices in the payday, auto title, and certain other high-cost lending markets that seem to deviate from other credit markets in at least two key respects. The first is with regard to underwriting. We do see some evidence that lenders are screening borrowers to try, try to account for upfront default risk, but they do not appear to be evaluating whether consumers can actually afford to repay their loans. And because so many consumers are getting unaffordable loans, they're left with a choice of three bad outcomes. One is taking out additional loans to try to give them some more time to figure out how to pay back. The second is to default on the covered loan, which often means loss of a vehicle where vehicle title has is, been taken in. And the third is to make the payment on the covered loan, but to shortchange themselves somewhere else, either with another major financial obligation or failing to be able to cover basic living expenses. What we're seeing is that this pattern of harms works out slightly differently with different products. So with very short-term products, we're seeing a great deal of reborrowing and some default. With longer-term products, the major concern is default in the first instance, that consumers simply are not making it through a sequence of loans at all. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the research part. The other major concern that the Bureau has is with regard to payment practices, and in particular that lenders in these markets are making unpredictable and repeated attempts to collect payments out of consumers' accounts. When this happens, it tends to cause a great deal of bank fees to accumulate quickly, either from non-sufficient fund fees or overdraft fees, and there appears to be an increased risk of account closure for the consumer, which has all sorts of spill-on effects for the consumer's financial stability overall. Whoops, there we go. So we are proposing to use a number of authorities in this rulemaking. The primary one is our authority under the Dodd-Frank Act to identify and prevent unfair, deceptive, and abusive acts and practices. The tests are laid out on the slide, but I won't go over them here. Uh, we're also using other authorities, including our disclosure authority exceptions and supervision of certain non-bank entities. 
The covered loans that we are proposing to cover are the same as they were last spring. It's short-term loans where the loans are the total amount due is due within 45 days either of consummation of the loan or of the advance of loan proceeds in a case where it's an open-end product which may have a multiple advances. For longer-term loans that are 46 days or longer, there are two thresholds that must be met before they would be covered under the proposal. The first is that the all-in cost of the loan would be above 36%. The second is that there is a form of leverage over the consumer, either that the lender takes account access, paycheck access, or vehicle title. We believe that those forms of leverage are causing consumers to continue paying on unaffordable loans past the point they would otherwise because something else is at stake. And in some cases, the lender is able to draw the money directly out of the account even if the consumer doesn't want to be paying at that point. The proposed exclusions are also, again, largely as they were last spring. It covers purchase money loans where an auto or a consumer good is being purchased with the funds that are being lended, real estate secured loans, credit cards, and so on. With overdraft services, the Bureau is doing a separate rulemaking on that topic, so we're not covering that here. Um, let's go on to the next page. The basic requirements are largely as they were last spring. The main requirement is that lenders are required to make a reasonable determination that consumers have the ability to repay all scheduled payments with, while also meeting major financial obligations and their basic living expenses without defaulting, without reborrowing. The proposal would specify a methodology that lenders would use to actually go through this calculation. And it proposes limited exceptions for loans that satisfy certain requirements where they would not have to apply the methodology, but there are other conditions layered on the loans to ensure that consumers would not get stuck in an unaffordable loan over a long period. The second set of interventions concerns the payment practices. One is to require a pre-withdrawal notice for most loans so that consumers know that the account um, withdrawal attempt is about to come. And the second would be a prohibition on further withdrawals after two unsuccessful attempts have been made across any channel. At that point, the lender would need to go back to the consumer and ask for an authorization before proceeding to try to withdraw funds again. The other pieces of the proposal address supporting requirements, things like developing uh, compliance policies and procedures, record keeping, and some of the credit reporting pieces that are necessary to make the other pieces work. So we'll talk briefly about those. The first part is the ability to repay requirements themselves. Um, the full payment test has a couple of components. The first is to ensure that the lender is getting the information they need to assess the consumer's ability to repay. So we're expecting that lenders would, be, would need to collect certain information from the consumer. One is the consumer's net income. The second is specified major financial obligations, such as housing, debt payments, and child support. And then the third is to pull their borrowing history so that they can assess recent activity in borrowing to see if that sheds light on whether the consumer is going to be able to afford the loan that they're applying for. Most of the changes that we've made in the last year on these elements are really to refine the process and try and think through ways we can make the process as least burdensome as possible for both consumers and lenders. So, for example, um, we've thought about ways that lenders may be able to, if they can get access to review borrowing history, excuse me, um, payroll history or account history to prove income. For housing, we've proposed a, uh, an option that, in addition to getting the actual information about consumers' rent, that lenders in certain circumstances would be able to estimate using reliable sources and compare that to what the consumer is reporting so that that might give lenders more flexibility to automate their processes and move through the process more quickly. So they're fine-tuning changes to try and make it more, uh, more flexible and, and, and easier for both sides. I'll come back to the consumer reporting piece at the end and we can talk a little bit more about that. With regard to the underwriting test, the basic concept is pretty simple, but you take the net income, you subtract the major financial obligations, and you see if there's enough money left over to pay the covered loan and to cover basic living expenses. The proposal would provide flexibility on how a lender would estimate basic living expenses. They could work through a process with the, the individual consumer to think about their individual, con but they could also use um, average 
estimate numbers if they're reliable. We're seeking comment in particular on a number of sources that might be useful here. We know the Bureau of Labor Statistics does some surveying on living expenses, and the IRS and bankruptcy courts also have been working with this concept. So we're hoping we'll be able to find ad additional sources that will be useful for, for people to use and make this process more, uh, more straightforward. Um, for short-term and balloon payments only, we, the proposal would require that lenders look not only for the term of the loan, but also for 30 days after the loan to make sure that the consumer can continue to make all those payments. Because these loans have such a pattern of reborrowing, we want to look at the period directly after the loan payment is made to make sure the consumer hasn't shortchanged themselves for something that's just coming due a few weeks later. For open-end loans, the proposal would require that the lender make certain assumptions about how the, the loan is going to be used and how quickly the consumer would draw down the funds. And we are also proposing that lenders would have to re-underwrite open-end lines of credit after 180 days if they are advancing additional funds. The concern here is that the consumer's financial situation could have changed substantially from their original underwriting, so we believe a periodic update makes sense. And then the last piece concerns the, the assessment of borrowing history. This is the place where we've made one of the largest changes since last spring, where we've been thinking a lot about the sequence of loans that can happen and what happens when the borrower is taking out multiple loans in quick succession. We think there's reason to believe that, that a first unaffordable loan may be spilling over to cause the consumer to take out the next loan. And that also, knowing what the consumer has been doing and how they have been able to pay or not pay recent loans also just tells the, the lender more generally about their ability to afford. So what we are expecting to do, similar to what we talked about last spring, is that there would be a presumption of unaffordability under certain circumstances where the borrower's recent history suggests there's cause for concern. But what we've decided to do for the proposal is to look at a 30-day period out from the last loan, rather than a 60-day period out from the last loan. We've thought, we've looked at various measures here, and it's a, a challenging balance to strike. But we think 30 days makes sense because it ties to the expense cycle for consumer. Consumer may be paid every two weeks, or they may be paid every four weeks, but their major expenses tend to come due on a monthly basis. So rather than tying to the income cycle, we think it makes sense to look at an expense cycle, and we believe there's reason to think that if the consumer cannot make it through a single expense cycle without going back in, that there's concern that that earlier loan is part of the problem that's fueling this, this ongoing cycle. So the, the presumption of affordability that we're proposing would apply in a couple of circumstances. One is where there are open-end loans or balloon payment loans and the consumer comes back in the 30 days. We're also proposing a presumption that would apply for other types of loans where the consumer comes back into the same lender or the affiliate and there are circumstances that make you think that the consumer's already in trouble. They've had a delinquency in the last 30 days, they've expressed concern that they can't afford the loan, or there are other circumstances that seem to indicate that the new loan is helping them to skip its payment or to get cash out simply to cover the loan they already had. There would be certain exceptions where the presumptions would not apply. So in circumstances where the payments are substantially smaller, the loan is substantially smaller, or the total cost of funds is going way down, that there are other things going on that may be to the consumer's benefit. There's less reason to think that the, the prior loan's unaffordability is causing the new uh, application. A presumption can be overcome where there is documented evidence that the consumer's financial capacity has improved since the last loan. One of the changes in this proposal relative to where we were last spring is we're really trying to put more definition around what is, is improvement in financial capacity. So one situation may be that the major financial obligations have changed. They've moved and their new rent expenses are going down. Or they've gotten a new job and their income is going up. Another circumstance that we think would apply here is in a circumstance where the consumers had one income shock Maybe um, they got laid off briefly or were sick or for some reason their income didn't perform as, as expected earlier, but there's, they're now back on stable ground and it makes sense to, there's no reason to think it's going to happen again. 
One place where we're seeking comment is with regard to expense shocks that have happened in the past and whether there's a way to account for those in this underwriting process without um, undermining the whole course of the rule. We think expense shocks are quite a bit more complicated and so that's an area where we're really particularly interested in getting comment about how to balance those concerns. There is one circumstance where the and a presumption could not be overcome. That's in the short term space. If the, lender, if the borrower has already taken out three loans within this 30 day cycle, so it's a three loan sequence, there would be a mandatory cooling off period for 30 days. At this point, we think it's highly unlikely that the consumer is going to be able to afford a fourth loan and that the lender is going to be able to underwrite accurately at this point. And so we think that at that point, a cooling off period is, is warranted. With regard to the limited exceptions to this overall frame, uh, there, there are three that we are proposing. There were a number of other options that we looked at last spring, and we are continuing to seek comment on those, even in places where we did not draft out full language for them. So we're really thinking about this area carefully and seeking a lot of comment to try and fine tune and get to the right answers. The first alternative would, is what we're calling the principal payoff option. This is a short term option. The basic concept is that lenders would not have to follow the residual income analysis and the presumptions in, uh, in circumstances where they're making a few limited loans to consumers to allow some flexibility. The maximum amount of these loans would be $500. And in a situation where the consumer comes back at the end of the loan or within 30 days and realizes that they need to reborrow, the lender could make smaller limited exceptions, but the extensions, but the idea is that the consumer would have to pay back one third with each increment so that within three loans they would be done, they'd be out of debt, and they would be um, not trapped in the kind of extended sequences that we've been seeing in our research. A mandatory cooling off period would apply at the end of the third loan again, and, and the consumer could go from there. There are certain other restrictions on these loans that would apply. We believe that first the lender would need to check reports and um, furnish information to the reporting system so that, because it's really important to understand where the consumer is if they've already had borrowing that's been going on in the recent past. Otherwise, the step-down process won't work properly, so it's particularly important in this in this setting. There are various other requirements, and this option would not be available in certain circumstances where we think there's particular risk and a full underwriting process is required. For instance, where the consumers already had short-term loans for more than 90 days or six loans within the last year, their borrowing is so heavy we really think a full underwriting is, is, is warranted. And the second situation is where there's open end credit or auto title involved. We think it's important that the consumer be fully underwritten to make sure that the, the lender has the full financial picture before making the loan. The lender would also would be required to issue certain disclosures to the consumer so that they understand how the step down process will work and that this loan has certain limitations on it. There are two options that we're proposing for longer term loans. One is based on the National Credit Union Administration's payday alternative loan program. You may remember this from last spring, it's, it's largely the same. The basic concept here is that any lender, not just credit unions, who make uh, loans that meet the PAL program parameters would be allowed to go ahead and do that without going through the full methodology that the general rule would require. There are a number of um, elements to the PAL program. The first is um, cost limitation, so it generally would be limited to 28% interest in an application fee of no more than $20. The loans must be fully amortizing with terms between 46 days and six months, and there are limits on the amount of principal. There are certain other requirements that we're proposing, for instance, to protect the consumer from having fee uh, funds swept out of their deposit accounts in connection with these loans. And a borrower cannot be indebted on these loans for more than three in a rolling 180-day period. So that's largely the same as it was in the spring, last spring. One of the challenges we faced is that a number of depository institutions told us that while they are doing other forms of relatively low-risk lending, this payment structure did not, this pricing structure did not really work for them. It didn't accord with what they were doing. They wanted a structure that allowed them to recover more of their underwriting costs up front with a lower interest rate. And so the second alternative that we're proposing is a new alternative where we're really trying to grapple with that question. So this is called a portfolio option. 
And the basic concept here is that uh, the, it would provide some more flexibility on the pricing structure along the lines that we just talked about. It would also look at back-end protections, specifically looking at the portfolio default rate for the, all of these loans being made by the lender. So the lender would be allowed to make these loans as long as their portfolio default rate did not exceed 5%. Um, that's consistent with the kind of accommodation lending that we're seeing from some of these depositories, and, so, and the risks are much lower than what we are seeing in the data from some of the other installment loans in this, in this section. So the basic concept is that the total cost of credit would be um, no more than 36% plus one origination fee that's reasonably proportional to the actual costs of, that the lender is putting in to originating the product there'd be a safe harbor for fees of $50 or lower. The loans would have to be fully amortizing. The, the terms that we're proposing are, are longer, so it could be 46 days to up to two years, so it's a little bit more flexible than the PAL program in that respect. There'd be restrictions on how many could be made within a rolling 180-day period. And if the lender exceeded the 5% default rate, they would have to refund origination fees to all borrowers. So we'll go on quickly to payment practices and the other um, elements of the rule, and then want to save some time to talk about the request for information and the research, and then we'll ha have lots of time for questions. Uh, on the payment collections requirements, as I said, and consistent with last spring, there are really two elements here. One is the pre-withdrawal notices, so that lenders would be re generally required to tell consumers at least three business days in advance that they're about to make a withdrawal attempt from the account. It would have basic information, contact info, the amount of principal fees, and so on. The second element is the, is the uh, prohibition on making further withdrawal attempts in a situation where the lender has already failed twice in succession. Uh, the lender at that point would need to send a notice to the consumer, tell them that this prohibition has been triggered, and then they can proceed to ask for a new authorization to withdraw more funds. The proposal would set out a specific process for them to use to make sure that the consumers has the information they need to make decision and that the, that the process of new authorization is going to work well. Uh, this requirement would apply across channel so that it applies even if the first attempt is by deposit and a check and the second is by ACH. Once you get to two, it's triggered. And that, we think that's extremely important because one of the things we're seeing here is that lenders often change channels when they're trying to withdraw funds from the account. As I mentioned, there are a number of supporting elements of the rule that we've also built out quite a bit since last spring. The first are pretty basic concepts. One is that we are proposing that lenders would be required to develop written policies and procedures to ensure compliance. That we would expect that these policies and procedures would vary depending on the lender's business model and scale and scope and so on. So we're not expecting a single uniform structure there. The second is that lenders would be required to retain records to demonstrate compliance with the rule for 36 months. Um, we are proposing some specific requirements with regard to certain types of core records and how they're going to be stored. One of the challenges here is that there will be in documentation information coming in to the lender from outside. And then there's also information that the lender is going to generate in the course of doing the underwriting and the other pieces of it. So we're trying to think about how to manage different systems and, and ensure consistency and facilitate both the lender's own um, compliance efforts as well as supervision. The other piece of this is the data reporting part of this with regard to consumer reporting. As I mentioned, borrowing history is a really important piece of what's happening here. The national uh, consumer reporting agencies don't generally collect data or accept data on many of these types of loans, but there are specialty CRAs that are developing in this market. What the Bureau is proposing is that certain CRAs could become registered with the Bureau if they meet basic requirements that they have. They have the systems to do the technology work to accept data and report it back out, that they uh, provide evidence that they comply with federal consumer laws and that their information security safeguards are sufficient. Once those systems are registered with the Bureau, we would require that lenders report basic information on the covered loans to them and pull a report back in the course of origination so that they would have information on the consumer's recent borrowing history. 
Um, this is a significant part of the rule. We had expected to do this in the spring last year, but we've put a great deal more thought into building out the required elements. And one of the effects of this is to really think about the effective date, because we need to think not only about the lenders getting prepared for this and building out their policies and procedures, but also the stand up of the reporting systems. We're proposing a 15-month implementation period and some staggered elements to that to help build out the credit reporting part, but we're seeking a great deal of comment on this because thinking about both elements of the implementation process is important. We want to ensure an orderly sequence that's good for lenders and for all the other participants, so that's something we're really thinking. Okay, so really briefly, I'm going to go through the RFI and research, and then we'll open the floor. So the request for information, there's, there's couple of things going on here. First, this is a really important step, we believe, to address very critical practices that are calling, causing a great deal of consumer harm. But we are very aware that it doesn't cover all products that are being marketed to consumers who are facing liquidity shortfalls, and it doesn't cover all practices even within the markets that we are covering. So there are two ways that the Bureau is approaching this. One is that we're already engaged in a number of other rulemakings that will start to tackle other pieces of this. So as I mentioned, and um, I certainly told you last spring, we're also working on debt collection rulemaking. We are separately considering overdraft rulemaking. We're also going to be looking at a larger participant rulemaking that will define what installment lenders and vehicle title lenders are subject to the Bureau's uh, supervision jurisdiction. A number of both industry and consumer groups have suggested to us that we look at a non-bank registration system as well um, as being particularly important in this market, and so that's another thing that we'll be looking at. But in addition to those specific work streams that were all, are already kind of in the least planning stages, we also wanted to open the floor for a broader discussion um, at the same time we, that we put the proposal out. So the request for information is really an attempt to do that. It focuses both on products and practices that are beyond the scope of the proposal. And it also asks more generally about market evolution. We know this evolution, that this, these markets tend to be very fluid, they change over time, and that this is a time of both technological change, regulatory change, new entrants, a lot of things going on. So as much, even as we work to complete this work stream, we also need to be thinking about what's going to happen next and where things will go and where the Bureau may need to concentrate its efforts going forward. And this isn't necessarily limited to rulemaking, it can also affect supervisor exams, enforcement, and consumer education efforts. So it's really a broad spectrum discussion. Really briefly, just to focus on the main elements, we believe that most of the liquidity lo loan products out there are going to fall within the scope of the proposal, but we have heard at least anecdotally of a few that don't. Most often, the, the reason that they fall outside the scope is because of that prong that focuses on leverage. They don't have account access, payroll access, or vehicle title as we've defined them under the proposal, but there may be other forms of leverage that are involved that are keeping the consumer there. So we're particularly interested in the underwriting practices and whether there is something else that the lender may be using besides an assessment of the consumer's ability to repay to um, change, kind of change the risk profile and keep themselves in business. So that's a significant part. And then more generally, we're just seeking information about what else is out there, how large they are, what conditions these, these other products are occurring in, um, and what kinds of new entrants are coming into the market. The second focus on risky practices focuses on a number of specific items. One is things like garnishment orders, judgment liens, and some other forms of what we're thinking of as kind of very specific enhanced collection. The second is default interest rates, late payment penalties, pre uh, prepayment penalties, and general um, back-end pricing practices. Loan churning in situations where a, a refinancing may not be spurred by the consumer's financial distress, but there may be other things going on about that refinancing that raise concerns, um, certainly about what the consumer understands about the new loan product and what's happening, and then add-on products are also an area of interest. We're also seeking comment on the role of non-lenders, so third-party organizations, brokers, credit service organizations, and other intermediaries that may play an important role in these markets and whether there are particular consumer concerns with regard to those. So the last topic is the research, and unfortunately our head economist couldn't be with us here today. I'm not going to try and do a full substitute. He uh, was able to join us for a committee call yesterday. 
But very briefly, we've released uh, two reports this spring, as well as the uh, report that came out in June. I'll just give you the very quick highlights. The first was a, a report focusing on online pay payday and payday installment uh, um, track record with regard to withdrawal attempts made through the automated clearinghouse network. Uh, what we found was that at least uh, half of borrowers' accounts had at least one debit attempt that failed or resulted in an overdraft in an 18-month study period, and that the average amount of fees for those consumers that had at least one failed account was $185 in bank penalty fees. There's an additional piece of this, which are lender penalty fees, which we can't see from the data. So that's a substantial additional cost that consumers probably don't know that they are risking when they take out these loans. We also found that there was a heightened um, increase in, in uh, account closure, so that 36% of accounts where there had been a failed attempt ended up closing, usually within 90 days. And that was significantly higher, four times higher, than the accounts where there was an NSF or an overdraft that didn't come from a payday or a payday installment source. So we compared those two, and it seems that there's a number of concerns here raised by that information. Uh, the next report was released in May, and it focused on single payment vehicle title. This, the results that we found were very similar to the results that we have reported in the past about payday lending. These, again, are short-term loans, generally 30 days. We found that more than 85% of loans were reborrowed, usually within the uh, same day, but certainly within 30 days of the last loan. And then about one-third of loan sequences ended in default. About 20% of loan sequences ended with the borrower's car being repossessed. So these are, you know, serious risk for consumers who may be depending on these vehicles to get to work, to get to medical care, and so on. Uh, we also found, very similar to what we found in payday, that the vast majority of loans being made are being made in ver in, to consumers in very long sequences of loans, so that more than half of all the loans being made were to uh, borrowers who had sequences of at least 10 loans in time. And again, very, very consistent with what we found in Penny. The June report has six elements. I'm not going to try and go through them all in much depth. The first one, um, chapter, though, I did want to call out, which is the evidence that we found regarding installment loans and pay, uh, vehicle title and payday installment loans. So these are loans uh, that are longer term. Some of them are balloon products where the consumer is paying just a small amount of interest and then paying one big payment in at the end, and some are even payments, so it's a mix. Um, we found a couple of things here. First of all, balloon payment loans show a lot of reborrowing, very similar to what we were seeing with short term. So if there seems to be a pattern where the consumer gets to the end of the loan, they can't make the last big payment, they roll it over. And the second thing is that the default rates were extraordinarily high on these loans. Uh, in the payday installment space, more than 40% of default of loan sequences ended in default. And on online space, the numbers were even higher. For vehicle title, about one-third of loan sequences ended default, and about 11% of the sequences ended with the consumer's uh, vehicle being uh, repossessed. The very last slide is just a short listing of the other chapters, which I commend to your reading. Um, I'll mention a couple of things on them briefly. Um, the first is on Chapter 2. So Chapter 2, we looked at what happened in, with bank deposit advance programs when the banks stopped offering this product. As you may remember, deposit advance programs look very similar to payday in the sense that they are required to be paid out of the consumer's next deposit. Uh, we saw very high rates of reborrowing and continuing activity in these programs were in our early research. A number of them have stopped since because of, of guidance from the prudential regulators. So we looked at what happened to the consumers after the product stopped. What we found is that there was a brief period of adjustments. For instance, consumers had more days with a negative balance after the DAP program stopped, if they were DAP borrowers. But overall, and over the long term, we found no increase in overdraft or NSF fees, no increase in payday lending <coughs> and borrowing from those. So the consumers were able to adjust to the stoppage of this program without 
showing signs of substantial financial distress in their accounts. So it's a really interesting report and it may be worth um, some further look. Chapter three spells out some of the data that we have about state um, impacts at a, a more deep level than what we had provided in earlier uh, presentations. One place we looked was at Texas, which has looked at disclosure regimes that were specifically targeted at trying to alert consumers to the risk of reborrowing and short-term loans. What we found was a relatively modest impacts, about 13% drop in loan volume, but a very small, only 2% drop in reborrowing. So what seems to be happening is that some consumers may have decided to do something else and not take out a loan originally, but the consumers who did take out the loans ended up in the same kinds of reborrowing sequences that they had before. It didn't have that kind of impact. The other thing that we looked at was also um, physical access to storefront payday lending in three states that had implemented new regimes. This was Virginia, Colorado, and Washington. Uh, what we found was that the three regimes had significant impacts on the number of stores in each of the states. But because there tend to be so many stores and they're relatively close to each other, the impact on physical geographic access was quite modest. Uh, the median increase was 1.2 miles, so relatively small. There is a little bit more in rural areas, it's probably not surprising, um, but very, very modest effects overall. Uh, so the fourth chapter looks at um, also information that we had already talked about at some level, but looking at the rates of reborrowing across different states that have different types of limitations on renewals and re reborrowing. What we found is that there was really no substantial difference. About 80% of the loans were being reborrowed, no matter what the particular state combination of rules was. The last two chapters are um, really helping, well, chapter five looks at different definitions of sequences, provides the information for 30-day sequences as well as 14 and 60, so that you can see the difference on, on how that affects. And then chapter six provides some supplemental information for our impacts analysis in the main document, to, uh, estimating different impacts of the different parts of the proposal. So I know that was a lot to cover. I'd be more than happy to answer questions and really look forward to all the discussion. As you know, we're in the ex parte period, so we'll be recording your feedback and um, you know, taking it under consideration. So. Great. Thank you. Um, you did a great job of condensing <laughs> hundreds, <laughs> almost thousands of pages into um, a very co coherent discussion. So. Um, Kathleen. Uh, this was great, Kelly, and, and um, it was a lot of information, and so I apologize if any of my questions you actually no gave the answers yeah. to as you were going along. I was trying to take notes. Um, I wanted to start with some of your questions. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, uh, the, the question about garnishment that mm -hmm. you were asking, I think, is really important because in many states, the garnishment laws are very antiquated. So, um, you know, the, the, uh, the way they've been drafted was to take the cost of living, you know, for a modest person um, at a particular time. And they don't all have cost of living increases. Some of them have, I've seen, have had a sort of an annual dollar amount that it will increase by like $25. But if you look at them, it's possible that, that under the state law, uh, a, a lender could go in and garnish all but, you know, $400 a month, and that's all the person has to live on. So I think that's a big, a big problem. Um, when you were asking about other liquidity loan products, mm -hmm. um, there's been, you know, the, the refund anticipation loans, which I would fall, put in that category, I think, um, have come back. And it's the same bank financing them that was financing them six or seven years ago when we thought they had disappeared for good. So that mm -hmm. was a product. I don't know how it, it doesn't, it's, it doesn't align quite as neatly as the others, but it seems like it falls in that category. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I, um, I gave Julianne an article about them earlier. Oh, thank you. Uh, um, and then um, two concerns I have is, is there, is there any vehicle that would allow payday lenders to know whether somebody has an outstanding payday loan at another, with another lenders? Because 
I, I, I like the restrictions on the rollovers, but they aren't effective if people can just go down the street. That's why we've proposed the requirements regarding registered information systems, because lenders would be required to report out at the time that they originate. So the information would be reflected in that system when someone else goes to pull the report. And then lenders would, re would be required to update and at the end of the loan, report back one last time to say this has been closed out. So we want to get a reasonably comprehensive system that's close to real time so that lenders have exactly that information to know what's outstanding, how recently the bar consumers borrowed and what their pattern is. Because uh, that's an incredibly important part of making sure that the interventions work properly. So. I think I missed that when I stepped out, but that's <laughs> terrific. Would yeah. that be something that would be run through the CFPB, that this kind of? Well, I, I, as we talked about, there are a number of specialty CRAs that are already emerging in this market. What we're expecting is they would be registered with the Bureau, but they would provide this um, without us having to provide a build a database to do that. So we believe the private market can supply this and probably put it in place faster than we could do if we built it from scratch. And then my last question is, I know there was some discussion about limiting the, in, in thinking about affordability, about having some bright line rule that says nobody's payment should exceed 5% of their income. And I saw that wasn't in the rule, um, but I'm wondering you're thinking about that. So that was actually an alternative option that we were looking at, not the main underwriting requirement. The main ability to repay analysis has always looked at residual income, as I talked about. But at last spring, when we were looking at potential alternative exceptions, we looked at a 5% payment to income option. We're still seeking comment on that. At the time that we um, got feedback about it last spring, people had mixed reactions. A number of banks and depositories told us that they couldn't do all of the accommodation lending that they are doing today under a 5% PTI threshold. Um, but we're continuing to say comment on that and I'm really looking forward to hear more and also to hear more about the new option that we've put on the table, which is looking at the portfolio default rate. That would give people flexibility to use payment to income or other forms of underwriting as long as they can hit that back end threshold. So that may provide additional flexibility. And like I said, we're just seeking comment on all the options at this point. And as I just, just to make sure I understand. But the, other thing, the other thing Kelly didn't mention is a lot of consumer groups were quite concerned about that option. They thought it was not yeah. protective enough and could uh, uh, facilitate some uh, what they viewed as abusive uh, lending. Yeah, one of the concerns is that for consumers at the very, very end of the income spectrum, that even 5% PTI might be too high. So I think one of the questions is whether having this back-end protection, which is looking at default ratios, may be a way, a better way to safeguard against those kinds of concerns. So we're continuing to seek comment. Thank you. So, and as I understand it, you're really thinking about kind of more like safe harbor provisions. Right. Is, is these sort would, of the way you're thinking about it. These would be alternative regimes that lenders could use if they, and consumers if they find them more flexible, but it's an alternative. The main underwriting analysis is the residual income analysis that I went through. So. Sure. So I, I have, I guess, two specific questions. I've been kind of okay. crossing some out. Um, so the, the first one is really about the, uh, the covered loan provision for longer term loans. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I saw that um, if it was over 45 days but did not include account for paycheck access that it was not covered. Or a vehicle title. They're or really, vehicle really title, really right. Could you, talk, could you talk about the, the rationale for sure. not covering those loans? Well, our concern is that we think that those forms of leverage are, are causing the dynamics to work differently for lenders and consumers alike. Um, that the lenders are less look likely to look at full ability to repay because they're really relying on those leverages as a kind of ability to collect model. And we think that that does two things to the consumer. One is that the consumer is likely to stay in the loan longer, even if they ultimately can't afford it. And remember, these have very high default rates. But the consumer is staying and paying longer than they would otherwise because their account's on the line. In some cases, the lender can pull the funds out whether the consumer likes it or not. And vehicle title's there, and they don't want to walk away from the car. 
So we think that they both pay longer, and then when they do default or run into other problems, the harms are bigger because they may lose their car, they may lose their account. The damage is greater because of those things. Those are the loans we've really focused on, that we've done the research on, and so that's what's in the proposal. But in the request for information, we are seeking comment exactly on the question of very high cost loans that don't have those kinds of leverage to see how many there are, how they work, whether lenders are doing ability to repay analysis, whether they've come up with some other form of leverage that might be a substitute instead. So we're kind of pursuing both prongs, but the, the proposal is focused on the ones where we've done the research. So the second question is on the, rec uh, the credit reporting. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit uh, more about how that might work and how y'all were able to potentially simulate the impacts on consumers with regard to how credit reporting might now affect? Well, we've, the impacts analysis of the proposal um, lay out everything we've been able to do so far, trying to think through impacts for both consumers and lenders. We think having access to this kind of information actually will be a substantial benefit. Um, that lenders, there are a substantial number of lenders who are working with specialty CRAs right now. What they're really looking for is that first payment default question, whether the consumer might walk away without ever paying anything. But the information in those systems really varies as to quality. Our sense is particularly when it comes to longer term loans, the quality is very sporadic. People may only report the first loan, they may not report all the time. So the information is not very high quality. We think having a reasonably comprehensive and real time system where all lenders can access this will make it better and really make the system work so that it is more predictable for lenders and consumers alike as to ability to repay. So we think it's gonna be a substantial actually benefit for lenders you know, as well as consumers. And the last one is just a comment. I'm really uh, happy to see that the registered information systems is in there and my hope is that once everything kind of gets up running that there will be access to you know, whether or not it's local or statewide data on, on you know, for, um, uh, for interested parties to be able to review uh, as, as a virtue of this, the, the, that system. Be interesting to see. Great. So uh, kind of less questions and providing a little bit of feedback and thank you Great. for this presentation. I don't envy <laughs> your, your having to try to, to summarize this as, as you did, you did a I terrific think I job. A so thank long, you for sorry. doing that. <laughs> um, yeah, you'll keep hearing that. It's, <laughs> it doesn't make it any less true. Um, so, uh, you know, we we think that there are certain there are areas within the the ability to repay standard and the unranked standard that, that do need to be strengthened, and that we're concerned about some of the potential loopholes that are there. Uh, we do believe that the ability to repay approach is the right way to do it, and so we applaud you for the for the approach that they're taking. And um, really, our concerns about the the loopholes are really informed by our experience with the Military Lending Act. So when the Department of Defense initially wrote rules to implement the Military Lending Act, we and others warned that there were significant loopholes that lenders could use to continue to make high-cost loans to service members, and that is, in fact, exactly what they did. DOD had to go back later and close those loopholes. So you can imagine that if lenders were willing to exploit loopholes to take advantage of service members, you can imagine what they would do to the rest of us. So, um, you know, we think that that's something that, you know, as we as this goes forward and we look forward to submitting a full comment, uh, we hope that uh, you'll continue to take a look at it and look at ways to strengthen the strengthen the rule. If those loopholes are closed, this this approach would provide protection for millions of consumers and would be a, a, a huge game changer uh, in the states. Um, I do want to point out one place where we, we did notice that there was a, uh, a significant strengthening from the Sabrifa proposal to the proposed rule, and it goes to Kathleen's point, removing the five the exception to the underwriting requirement for loans where the payments were less than 5% of the, of the borrower's income. And the supplemental findings, we were happy to see the, the data that, that, and, you know, that, that confirmed that even with that, that approach, a number of loans would still be too expensive for, for borrowers to be able to handle, and so we were uh, glad to see that that approach was, was removed from the, from the proposed rule. Um, one other suggestion that we, we would make is to provide states additional enforcement tools that they can use, um, particularly states that have already either uh, prohibited payday lending or car title lending or have significant restrictions on those loans. Uh, and, the, and the way we would suggest to do that is to, uh, uh, is to consider any loan that's made in violation of a state's interest rate limits or usury limits to be deemed an unfair and deceptive actor practice. Um, 
so that states would have that tool to be able to use to enforce against lenders that would go in and try to circumvent their, uh, their interest rate laws. Um, and it would also help to, uh, it would also help to protect those, those states where they have taken those steps uh, versus states that have not. Uh, we're also pleased to see the additional questions and the additional, the, the RFI. Um, we've had long-standing concerns about the traditional installment industry, and two, two points in particular that you, you raise. One is loan churning, and certainly we've seen quite a bit of data that suggests that people in, in those installment loans, even at lower interest rates, still are getting repeatedly refinanced in those loans. For instance, in North Carolina, where the regulator reports lots of data, 80% um, of the loans made, and this is consistent for the last 15 years, are made either to existing consumers or to people who have previously had a loan with the company. So there's significant repeat borrowing. And then add-on products, credit insurance, and the use of credit insurance. And um, again, in North Carolina, the, the Commissioner of Banks report showed that in the last, the last report, there were more credit insurance policies sold than there were loans made. Um, so that is certainly something that is prevalent in this, in this area. Um, and in fact, one publicly traded lender uh, suggests that they use credit insurance as a way to circumvent uh, state interest rate laws. Since most state interest rate limits follow TILA, they exclude credit insurance from those interest rate limits. And so in states where there's lower limits, they sell more credit insurance than in states where they don't. So it's certainly something to take a look at. So thanks again for, for everything and for giving me the opportunity to, to, to share my thoughts. This is really great, and it's a huge bill, and I haven't read through all of it yet. But um, so maybe my question's answered another part you didn't cover. It. But one of the areas that I find most abusive about this is the collection of them. And you mentioned the um, pre withdrawal notice, which exists in other areas of the law, but I've run into a constant problem with this that what does it actually mean? And this is my question. So. Um, for instance, when a customer gets this pre-withdrawn notice and then calls up in their rights and says, hey, wait, don't do that, I know there's no money in the bank, there's nothing that prevents them from putting the check through and it bouncing anyway. Um, so to me, the, the notice doesn't have any teeth unless the consumer has the right to say, hey, there's no money in there, don't, don't do that. Um, the second thing is that um, this industry uses the um, and this might be something better dealt with in the fair debt rules, which I know are to be announced at some point in time. Um, they use the bad check laws, so essentially they try to use they try to use the criminal laws as a as a sword here and claim you know you're deceptive, you've written a bad check, and you're going to get arrested and all that. So it would be useful whether it's here or in the next project to have something that prohibits using deceptive check laws and the criminal law in the collection of these debts? Um, well, yeah, no, I, I, uh, I just wanted to, to, to say that I think this is an incredibly important uh, move um, by the CFPB, and, um, and I, I think it, 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 it's uh, addressing a, um, an issue which is obviously of critical importance, but um, I, I, I wanted to, to just, uh, ask, because I'm getting a lot of questions, and I'm only really just beginning to learn more uh, about this, um, that, that um, uh, um, what, uh, I understand the, the attempt to try to limit, and it, I think it's a laudable attempt to try to let people know that they should not get into these types of, of, uh, of mechanisms without them being able to really find a way out at, at the end. Um, and I'm just uh, curious, though, the, the uh, the, the, your, the position on the, this debate, if you could clarify that a bit, that, that uh, was mentioned in the New York Times editorial and, and the Pew uh, uh, comments, that somehow this 5% cap uh, would, 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 would be a, a, a stronger way of addressing uh, the same objective of trying to maintain. And, and uh, I, I understood you, you addressed that. If you could address that a bit more, uh, carefully, because I'm getting a lot of questions uh, about that, and, and the other the other question here. I mean, I think the broader issue is that what's really going on is that there's this pay, a lot of payday lending, and I'm I'm sure the research, your research, is, uh, as well as other people's research, have shown this that it's it's a um, it's usually an emergency type of a of a situation, 
what other types of mechanisms could we begin to start thinking? Uh, and obviously, um, you don't have the answer this minute, but it's obviously a question that I think we need to think about, right? How do we uh, incentivize the, the industry uh, and maybe some other ways of, of, of an initial loan turning into a more manageable installment uh, after a while, uh, uh, if, if there's any thinking about how to move forward on, on how to create a more sustainable uh, uh, solution. Sure. Um, well, very briefly, since we're kind of running short on time, um, as I said, we're continuing to see comment on the 5% payment to option, payment to income option. Um, at the time that we started talking about last spring, we heard a couple of concerns. One was that for very, very low income consumers, even 5% was too much and that it would still lead to default. And on the other side, we heard from another a number of banks, credit unions, other lenders saying it wasn't high enough. It wouldn't allow them to continue the kind of low risk lending that they're doing today, let alone incentivize them to do a lot more. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we haven't put quite as much energy into it, but we are continuing to seek comment. In the meantime, we've also developed this new approach, which is looking at this back-end option, 5% default rate on the portfolio, which we think might get closer to the real consumer harm that's at issue, while still giving lenders a lot of flexibility to use whatever underwriting they find gets them to that number. So we are definitely thinking about that. In terms of the broader question, I think that we expect that this proposal, if it was finalized, would do a great deal to encourage lenders to start looking at other options and longer term loans in some circumstances where that's really what the consumer needs. That a 45 day option is just not practical for this consumer to pay back that much money that fast, but that a longer term approach might be more predictable and more likely to succeed. But I think there are other pieces to this that involve consumer education and outreach and you know a lot of other topics. And maybe we could come back and do another broader presentation and, and discussion about some of those other pieces beyond the scope of this particular proposal. So, But, but let me be a little more direct on the, the New York Times editorial that you had asked me about. Uh, at the premise of the editorial was based on a fundamental mistaken understanding of, of the 5% proposal. Nobody had ever put forward the 5% proposal as the, the uh, protection of consumers in this area. It's always been the ability to repay framework that's the fundamental protection of consumers in this area. And the notion we would throw out the ability to repay framework in favor of 5% being the limitation on what you could lend to consumers and that being sufficient is something that a number of consumer groups had real problems with. Instead, this was only ever presented as an alternative uh, exception to the longer term loans, so it was only ever a loosening, not a tightening. So the notion that we uh, set it aside, which we did in terms of the text of the proposal, but we're asking questions about it and thinking more about it could never have been a problem with toughening the rule. It would have been a, a, an issue of possibly loosening the rule in certain respects to facilitate certain types of lending. So I think that's, that's where there was a fundamental misunderstanding uh, in that discussion. Okay. So I, I have a question building on what Kathleen asked about lending from multiple lenders, and I wanted to give you a specific scenario just to understand how it would play out. So if someone came and got a single payment loan that was not underwritten under the repaying 30% or one third of the loan with each payment, so they went to one lender and then at the due date went to another lender and got another loan to repay that loan what would apply? How would that scenario work? Well, there's certain restrictions that we're, we've proposed to try to make sure that consumers are either in the ability to repay zone or they're in the alternative space and they don't jump back and forth. There are also some limitations that we're proposing to try to make sure that the step-down process works properly so that if they're already outstanding loans, that that gets taken into account and a consumer either can't get the new loan or that the one-third step-down applies. So there are a number of pieces in the proposal that we're seeking comment on to make sure that we can govern that situation. We are concerned about consumers having two loans out at the same time because that interferes with the step-down process. And so we're trying to figure out exactly how to make sure that that works properly. And it is an issue that we've identified and are kind of trying to work through. So if, we'll be really looking forward to people's comment on whether the way that we're restricting that 
would work. In certain circumstances, the consumer sh simply couldn't get the second loan. Maybe that wouldn't be allowed because it would it would mess up the the step down process. And so, otherwise, it would be that you could get a new loan from the new lender where you're paying down the principal, and then you would just be able to have one more loan, even though it's a new lender. Is that well, what you're that's what we're trying to do. We don't necessarily want to lock borrowers in with the same lender over time if they want to switch, but we do want to make the one-third step-down process work proce properly. So that's exactly the balance we're trying to strike. Okay, thank you. And just to add, one of the requirements is that before the second lender could make that loan, they would have to check the re with the registered information right. system. And that's exactly right. Find out okay. and discover that there already is an existing loan and as a result, they would be subject to the same rules that the first lender would be in terms of this being a second loan. Yeah, that's part of the process to make sure it works properly and that the consumer shouldn't slip through. Yeah. Thanks. Um, incredibly thoughtful process, agonizingly thoughtful process. It almost hurts to listen to it because <laughs> just imagining. So uh, I'm greatly appreciative of that and uh, love and ability to repay approach um, and have not in life fully digested the, the rule. But one quick question is about the 45 day, uh, 45 day cutoff. I think when consumers experience a, a bump in the road financially, I think we're finding, I think the US Financial Diaries has been one source of information, but there are other sources of information to suggest that maybe it takes more like 60 to 90 days before somebody's able to get rolling again. So in my comment letter, there will be a discussion of that, but I wanted to ask you um, why that time period? So uh, there are a couple time periods that might be helpful to talk about. The 45-day time period separates short-term loans that are covered from long-term loans. So, um, but I think what you're really focusing on is what's the length of sequence time that really means the two loans are related to each other? That's the question that we're focusing on. Um, it's a complicated one. We've looked at everything from 14 days to 30 to 60 days, and um, there's no magic formula. There's no scientific number that you can point to and say that is the right place to draw the line. So it's a balancing act, and we're trying to think through a number of considerations. We think that 30 days makes more sense than 14 days because it does give you that one complete expense cycle. Like I said, the borrower's income can be coming in in different ways at different times, but the expense cycle is pretty consistent for most consumers, and we think that gives you a good snapshot of their overall picture. If they can't make it to the end of the expense cycle without reborrowing, there's a pretty good you know, suggestion that that prior loan may be part of the problem here. So you can go farther out, and there may be circumstances where the loan itself is causing more problems even farther out, but we think that's less likely as time goes on, and that it may be more likely that other things have occurred in the course of the consumer's financial situation that are just different that happen downstream. So we have to consider the causation and the, the consumer's access to credit in those circumstances and what makes sense. So we were really looking at the sequence based on how likely was it that the last loan is part of the problem, as opposed to is there another shot going on? As I said, one of the things we're really trying to think about is how the presumptions apply in cases where there has been an income shock, shock or an expense shock, where it's not the prior loan, there's something else that's happened to the consumer, but how does that affect their ability to repay, and how should the lender work through that situation to determine whether you know, they have a reasonable chance of repaying? So it's a really complicated set of situations, and we you know, really look forward to comment about what people are seeing and in, in, in income and expect shots. There's no question that's a really important question for this population of borrowers. We know a lot of what's happening is has to do with shock you know, situations, and so we want to be as thoughtful as we can be in working through how that affects the overall underwriting process that the lender goes through. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. I, I'm also thinking, thank you for that, and mm -hmm. I'm also thinking about just coverage and how a short-term loan is defined. Mm -hmm. If it were defined as 90 days or less, for example, 
I'm thinking about trying to capture more loans because I am thinking about the Military Lending Act, who was talking about that issue of, oh, we'll just go ahead and price and put the timing over a certain line. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, I think, was a, is a slightly different issue. Sure. So we have thought about this a lot. And again, no magic formula. Um, we picked 45 days because most of the loans that we're talking about in the short-term space are generally about one pay cycle long. So for consumers who are on a monthly cycle, it's generally about 30 days. But sometimes if the consumer comes right before a payday, they'll actually go to 42, 45. So that was the way that we were looking at that. The definition for a longer term loan is 46 days or longer, but it includes, as we talked about, total cost of credit above the 36% threshold and either paycheck access, account access, or vehicle title access. So we think that when it comes to payday, payday installment, vehicle title installment, we're picking up those loans. We're just picking them up in the longer term long category. Term. Um, but we are very conscious of the MLA experience. And we are seeking comment on whether we've drawn the lines in the right place, both on coverage and a wide variety of other parts of the proposal. And we are also have, are proposing an anti-evasion provision, really trying to think through places is where um, you know lenders might try to work around the, the language to in a way that would be inconsistent with what we're trying to accomplish in terms of consumer protection. And, and you know, admittedly, there is some real complexity here, and that's a mm -hmm. that's an issue. Uh, but there's a lot of moving parts, and in this marketplace, things are very fluid. And there, we have seen evasion of the law in the past with the Military Lending Act, and and at the state level. And it's something that we're trying hard to address. Uh, we're very interested in hearing comment on uh, how, how we're doing in terms of trying to address that sufficiently in a satisfactory way, in a workable way. That's something we're very interested in input on as we go forward. What's amazing to me, Kelly, is that you've been doing this for so many years now, and you still come up with rules that are innovative and really try to oh, you know, meet the needs of consumers and industry. It's just a really impressive enterprise here that you have. Um, I, I just want to be clear that I understand the affordability requirements. And the 5% the, um, the portfolio default rate is only for the longer term loans, correct? That's a Right. So the general requirement for longer term is to follow the ability to repay analysis using the residual income yes. analysis and the presumptions in certain circumstances. There are two alternatives. One is the PAL program, and one would be the 5% default portfolio structure. So it would only be as an alternative for longer term loans. It wouldn't be available for short term loans. So okay. I'm curious how you came up with the 5% and how industry responded, because that seems like a very, very low default rate for these products. Well, we're waiting to see what kind of response we get. Um, where we started the discussion was with banks and credit unions that are already doing some accommodation lending that seems to involve substantial underwriting, although it may not look exactly like our ability to repay methodology. And they're getting very good results with very low default rates. So our understanding from what they've told us is that 5% is in this, in this range for them, that they are able to be in that range. Obviously, we're going to seek a huge amount of comment. And you know we'll hear from different lenders in different parts of the market as to what's practicable, whether that's the right number, and also really seek in, um, input from consumer advocates and so on about whether that's the right number. But, we thought it was an interesting concept to start looking at this kind of back-end protection to see whether that was a way to provide more flexibility on the front end while still making sure that the primary harms that we're seeing with installment loans are getting addressed and that this is a you know, relatively safe, narrow space that, that might encourage more people within this range to, to get into this market and do you know, more activity. I think that's exactly the right approach. I certainly think it's been our experience that within the parameters that you outlined, the interest rate, I think is 28% for in the, in the NCUA uh, model, as well as the 5% default rate, uh, strikes me that any responsible lender can make loans within those parameters. Um, uh, I'd also just, just applaud you on the flexibility and the thoughtfulness that you've approached this. We, um, 
Um, I think releasing the re additional research along with the uh, proposed rule is very helpful um, and opening up for information. Um, RFI is going to obviously inform this process, but um, we've already seen, again, with the Military Lending Act, and, and as the, it was became clear that the Bureau is going to start taking seriously uh, um, protecting consumers against abusive payday um, loans that lenders have already started to gravitate toward different models, installment loans, and trying to fit and trying to encourage state policymakers to shift their rules to accommodate them. Um, I think the supplemental research helps, and hopefully is, is intended to send the signal that if it smells like a skunk and it has stripes, then it's a skunk. And it's going to be, you know, they, they, um, it's just not gonna be the type of evasion that we saw allowed uh, during the military, uh, uh, with the military lending um, rules. And so, again, I applaud you for the approach and I applaud the Bureau for taking this historic step in protecting consumers. I think with that, I would like to turn the, um, thank the CAB and thank you for that presentation and like to turn uh, the meeting over to Zix. from industry, from our state and local partners, and from community advocates across the U.S. And obviously one of the ways that the Bureau gathers public feedback is through events such as these. To date, the CFPB's CAB has held public sessions across the U.S., including um, sessions in St. Louis, Missouri, Los Angeles, California, Itabena, Mississippi, Reno, Nevada, and Little Rock, Arkansas. At these CAB meetings, we not only hear from experts, we also invite the public to participate. But before I open the floor for public comments, I want to remind folks that are here today that there are several other ways that you can communicate your observations, concerns, or complaints to the CFPB. You can submit a consumer complaint with the CFPB through our website at consumerfinance.gov. Our website will walk you through that process, or you can call 1-855-411-2372. The CFPB takes complaints about mortgages, car loans or leases, payday loans, student loans, or other consumer loans. We also take complaints about credit cards, prepaid cards, credit reporting, debt collection, money transfers, bank accounts and services, or other financial services. If you don't have a specific complaint but would like to share your story with us, we have a feature on our website called Tell Your Story, where you can tell us your story, good or bad, about your experience with consumer financial products or services. Your story will help inform the work that we do to protect consumers and create a fairer marketplace. We have another feature called Ask CFPB where you can find answers to over a thousand frequently asked questions about consumer issues, as well as additional resources. We also have a Spanish language website called CFPB en Español, which provides access to essential consumer resources, as well as answers to consumers' frequently asked questions. I encourage you to visit consumerfinance.gov to learn more about the resources and tools that the Bureau has developed to help consumers make the best decisions for themselves and for their family. Now it's time to hear from members of the public that are here today. A total of two individuals have signed up to share public comments and observations about today's discussion. The public comment portion of the field hearing is an important opportunity for the CFPB to hear about what's happening in consumer finance markets in your community. We typically encourage comments to be about two minutes, but I am mindful that there are only two individuals that signed up today. So with that, I'll call our first public commenter, and that is Hank Klein. I'm going to sit back down. 
Hi, my name's Hank Klein. I founded a coalition here in Arkansas called Arkansans Against Abusive Payday Lending in 2004. Our goal was to rid our state of predatory payday lending, and we were successful in 2009, and Arkansas has been a payday lending free state for seven years now. How are our citizens doing? Very well. No longer are citizens subject to borrowing small amounts of money they can't afford to repay. No longer are the citizens subject to renewing those loans over and over and over again because the borrower really couldn't afford the loan to begin with. A recent survey conducted in Arkansas seven years after the payday lenders have left our state found a significant majority of borrowers said their financial life was better since they were no longer enticed by the offer of quick cash by high-cost payday lenders. Although payday lending may seem like a, a lifeline during times of financial strife, it's actually an anchor that causes borrowers to sink deeper and deeper into a sea of debt that's very hard to get out of. Without payday lending, and we don't have title pawn lending in our state either, uh, the Center for Responsible Lending has estimated that our citizens annually have $139 million in their pockets every year to take care of life's necessities because they don't have to pay those high interest rates. In your proposed regulation issued last week, one thing the CFPB got right was not including the proposed safe harbor that would exempt loans from underwriting based solely on whether the loan payments were 5% of the bar or less than 5% of the borrower's income. Assessing income alone is not enough to ensure that affordable loans are safe. The CFPB uh, data released confirms this. Your data shows that installment payday loans whose monthly payments do not exceed 5% have a default rate of 25 to 40%. That's leaving families worse off, not better off. As the rule moves forward, there are other important ways that the Bureau can continue to strengthen the rule to close the business as usual loophole that's too easily gamed by the payday lenders. For example, the ability to pay rule does not go far enough to ensure that after repaying the loan, the borrowers still have enough money left over to pay for basic living expenses without having to reborrow. The CFPB should also strengthen the enforceability of our state laws by declaring that your payday lending rule that are offering, uh, making, collecting, or facilitating loans that violate a state usury or other consumer protection laws of a state would be unfair, deceptive, uh, and abusive acts or practices, UDAP. The number of enforcement actions that the Bureau has taken in the last few years should be applauded, especially those under payday lenders, debt collectors, payment processors, and lead generators. They all provide a strong foundation for including this explicit determination in your uh, payday lending rule. Uh, uh, by doing so, the CFPB will uh, offer states additional and stronger tools to crack down on illegal lending and ineffective enforcement of their laws. Just as the Arkansas Supreme Court and the Attorney General did rid our state of high-cost predatory lending, I urge the CFPB, CFPB to issue a final regulation without loopholes to hold the high-cost lenders, payday lenders, auto title, and installment lenders accountable to ensure that borrowers have the true ability to repay the loans and are not trapped in an endless renewal and refinancing because they really couldn't afford the loan in the first place. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Klein. Judy Urich. My name is uh, Judy Gurick. And my work life, I was a family resource management specialist through the University of Arkansas Cooperative Extension Service. And in fact, most of my career was involved in teaching people family financial management. And I'm going to speak from the aspects 
of education. I think it's really tough when you're a lonely, lonely consumer covered by debt and you're trying to work against the establishment, which is the production side of the equation. And I like to say that I think that we need to encourage more players into this, not necessarily nonprofits. I want to tell you about when I first came to Arkansas, I lived in Mississippi County, which borders on the Mississippi River, and to the north is the Missouri Butte Hill. This is a persistently, what at the time was regarded, probably still is, as a persistently poor county in the United States. And I heard about this new manager at a factory east of town. Now this is one of the smaller, many, the, an example of the many smaller factories in Arkansas. And he wanted to work with his workers and really upgrade and make sure that he had a really vital workforce. And his enlightened uh, employees said, well, why don't you do something about these garnishments? And so how many garnishments were there in this factory? Somewhere in the neighborhood of 15. So his solution was to work with his employees and he asked me to help and we talked about budgeting and credit and all those basic financial strategies. Then he lowered the boom. He said, you know, you've been educated and she's here in town, you, meaning me, you can call her and I'm going to frown on any more garnishments. Well, I got a few phone calls and uh, one of the messages is I will be fired. What a motivator. But believe it or not, after a two-year period, I checked how many garnishments were there in the factory? One. So using, it's a stick approach, and maybe that's the wrong thing. It was an educational approach, which I like to think was the right thing, but it was a motivator. And whatever happened back in the family when they worked their way through, I do not know but it is possible to do things through other, other means. After I remembered that, some of my colleagues before I retired were doing work on the effect of financial management problems in your employees on your productivity. Well, what they found out is that employers, when you hire an employee that has lots of problems, and you can't tell me that the people that you're writing these regs for don't have financial problems, because they do. You take, at a minimum, a 20% hit. In other words, you hire somebody for 40 hours a week, and you're going to get, at best, 30 hours. So as you work your way through this, I just uh, want to encourage you to kind of always, you're looking at the nuts and bolts and that's really important and it just places my eyes over and I'm retired and I don't have to deal with it. But, you know, looking at this broader picture and enlisting these sectors that are providing your productivity and getting the best employees possible would go a long way. Thank you for letting me talk. Of course, thank you for being here today. Thank you all that provided thoughtful testimony. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to our CAB members. Uh, thank you again to the audience. You all have been here all day and I really appreciate that. We all do. This concludes the CFPB's CAB meeting in Little Rock, Arkansas. Have a terrific afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.